mentioned today we would like to keep in time therefore please uh, use also the uh, little uh, table for um, uh, for fixing your questions to speakers when they would go otherwise over time we have next morning the discussion section so you find the address of this table for the questions uh, to the speakers in uh, in the chat of uh, of the zoom okay and uh, all here in the room please also uh, short questions concise answers and uh, did i forget anything no then let's open the afternoon session with Arnold Ripold about uh, the all about dialectomes. Yeah, thank you. So first of all, I would like to uh, thank the organizers for the opportunity and the honor of uh, giving this uh, overview talk on the theory of dialectomes. Um, it's very good to, good to be back in Trento, of course, in particular in person. And as you can see, I'm now at the University of Gießen since the 1st of October this year, actually. So this is uh, the outline of my talk. I will start with some introduction and motivation. Then I will come to the theory on dileptons in heavy ion collisions, where I will focus on the thermal dilepton. So I will discuss the thermal dilepton rate and vector meson spectral functions. I will point out the connection to chiral symmetry and also to the axial vector spectral function. And then I will show you some results, um, which we obtained recently on vector and axial vector mesons in nuclear matter, um, which we obtained using the AFRG method, which I will come back to. And then I will uh, uh, go to some applications. So how we can use dileptons as a thermometer, as a chronometer, as a, a polarimeter, maybe even to get some information on the electrical conductivity. And then I will show you some comparisons between degree and experiment. So let me start with this uh, nice picture of the space-time evolution of a heavy ion collision, where you see all the different phases starting from the pre-equilibrium phase, going to the QGP, the hadron gas phase and the freeze-out phase. And in this talk, of course, I will focus on dileptons, so we mean um, correlated pairs of electrons and uh, positrons or muons, antimuons, which are generated by the same uh, particle, where you can see some examples originating uh, somewhere here. Of course, they are uh, generated at all stages of the collision, but I will focus here on the maybe more interesting phases of the QGP and the hot hadron gas phase, where we can learn a lot um, about this collision. For example, we can learn about the temperature uh, of the fireball, about the lifetime of the fireball, also in looking uh, at the angular distribution uh, of the dileptons, we can learn about the polarization of the virtual photons that produce them. So we can learn about the, the processes that generated them. We can in principle also learn about the electrical conductivity of this medium and um, also some aspects about the QCD phase diagram. For example, um, when we look at the lifetime um, Did you read the of message the fireball, from Walter? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think it's yeah. Yeah, yeah. So okay. Only I don't understand why I don't reproduce your result. I have always something. Which is, I'm running again. Something which is a much smaller. Elena, okay, Elena, I, I, Elena, Elena. So much, but okay. I can, can we mute her? Yeah. You can just take the numbers and put some stuff. Yeah, yeah, because anyhow, I have to and more range than anybody. And upper, so yeah, we yeah, can increase yeah. a little bit this range. <laughs> Either it's so much depends. It also depends on nu, honestly, very strongly, and on fluctuations still. Elena, and you are in the up next speaking. Number which are smaller than yours. And that is a very funny, because I just run your code without changes. The host can mute anybody. For example, at the, at the low mass uh, dileptons, we can learn about the, the lifetime of the fireball. And if we see some 
uh, deviations from expected model calculations in the lifetime, for example, a flattening of the curve with respect to collision energy, we may see, or this may indicate the first order phase transition where latent heat has to be burned off. Uh, and when we uh, look, for example, oh, that was the other thing. Sorry, I, I was confused. So um, the lifetime may be longer near the critical point and the first order phase transition we can actually get uh, by looking at the temperature, which is more in the intermediate mass range, and there the latent heat uh, possibly has to be burned off. So then we can see indications for this first order phase transition. Of course, we can also uh, try to learn about chiral symmetry uh, more directly. So between the, the hadron gas phase and the quark gluon plasma, where chiral symmetry is uh, restored at high temperatures and densities, and in the hadron gas phase where it is broken. So um, here, I hope you can see the title. Why do we need dileptons or why are dileptons so special? Well, they are electromagnetic probes like photons, uh, which means that they don't interact directly with uh, the medium via the strong interaction. This means that they have a long mean free path and can therefore carry information from their production site to the detectors. And as I mentioned, they are produced at all stages of the collision. So in summary, dileptons are uniquely well suited to study the properties of hot and dense matter in heavy ion collisions. And uh, what kind of dileptons do we have? So here is some uh, classification um, which we can use. So first of all, we have here the Trellians, uh, so primordial QQ bar annihilation, which uh, generates here E plus E minus pairs in this example. And you have the corresponding diagram here. Uh, then we have the more interesting um, dileptons coming here from thermal radiation from the QGP and from hadrons. So for example, QQ bar annihilation, pion annihilation, which you also see here in this diagram. Then we have decays of short-lived resonances where it's very important to have the row here, for example, which decays via a virtual photon here into a dilepton pair. And we have multi-meson reactions, so these four pi channels pi rho, pi omega, rho rho, pi a1, and so on. And then of course, we also have the decays of long-lived mesons and baryons, for example, from the pi zero, eta, phi, j psi, and so on. And here you have one example for these DD bar pairs. Um, so what can we learn from dileptons? Let me summarize this once again. And you also see this sketch of a typical uh, dilepton invariant mass spectrum here. So we can in principle learn about the temperature, the fireball lifetime, degree of collectivity, in medium spectral functions, functions and the connection to chiral symmetry, changes in degrees of freedom, um, also the production mechanism by looking at the polarization of the virtual photons and in principle also about transport coefficients like the electrical conductivity in this very low mass, low PT point here. Okay, so let me come to the theory. How can we actually calculate uh, dilepton production rates? And there are two uh, possibilities, basically. One is a thermal field theory, where the electromagnetic correlation function is the central object, which you see here. So this is this uh, commutator here of the electromagnetic current, which you can also um, draw diagrammatically like this. And this object then determines both the photon and the dilepton rates, as you see here. So first the photon rate, where you have the electromagnetic coupling strength, some Bose distribution factor, and then the imaginary part of this correlation function, which we then call the spectral function. Of course, evaluated here at mass zero for the photons and at some finite mass for the dileptons, but otherwise these formulas look very similar. One difference is, of course, that you have here a square for the EM coupling strengths compared to the photons, where it's just the first power. Uh, another possibility to compute uh, thermal dilepton rates is using relativistic kinetic theory. And here you see the master formula down here, which is uh, based on these matrix elements. So this is a microscopic approach, which is, for example, very well suited um, for computations at higher energies. So for example, perturbation theory, while the thermal field theory framework 
is uh, the method of choice for medium effects at the moderate temperatures. Okay, so uh, how can we calculate or obtain this EM spectral function? Well, in the vacuum, it's uh, actually accurately known experimentally from E plus E minus annihilation, which you see here. So this is this famous R ratio where you um, have the cross section of E plus E minus going into hadrons over the cross section of E plus E minus going into muons, which is directly proportional to this uh, EM spectral function. And you see the R ratio plotted here taken from the particle data group. And you see in the low mass region, uh, the vector mesons, the rho, the omega, and the phi really are the important building blocks here. So they saturate the EM spectral function, which gives rise to this uh, vector meson dominance model. So you can write the EM spectral function as a combination of spectral functions of the light vector mesons, rho, omega, and phi in this way. And at higher energies, you see this uh, dissolves into a continuum which you can then describe in terms of perturbation theory and quark degrees of freedom. So you see there is a, a close connection between uh, vector mesons and the EM spectral function and therefore dileptons, which is of course because vector mesons have the same quantum numbers as photons and can therefore directly decay into dileptons, which you see in this diagram here. So you have the vector meson coming from the hadronic medium which transforms into a virtual photon and then decays into a electron positron pair here. And this vector meson dominance actually works very well also when you describe um, experimental data quantitatively. So here you see a computation by Ralf Rapp and Hendrik van Hees um, based on hadronic many body theory, which, which I will come back to, which very nicely describes these uh, high precision data from NA60. And, uh, um, so basically what goes in here is the rho meson spectral function, which is the main contribution to the EM spectral function, which you also see by these prefactors. So most of the effort in this field has really gone into computing the rho meson spectral function in the medium. Um, there is of course also a close connection to chiral symmetry, which I want to point out here. So let me remind you that chiral symmetry is a symmetry of the QCD Lagrangian in the limit of vanishing quark masses which is uh, spontaneously broken by the dynamical formation of a quark condensate. And here you see uh, results from lattice QCD and also functional methods, which show you that the quark condensate decreases with increasing temperature. So chiral symmetry uh, is broken here in the vacuum and then is restored uh, at higher temperatures. And this has uh, direct consequences also on the vector meson and axial vector meson spectral functions, which you can see, for example, by looking at this uh, at the sum rules, so QCD and chiral sum rules, which in general uh, connect differences of this vector and axial vector channel with condensates. In this case, here the quark condensate. So you see when the quark condensate vanishes, also the difference between vector and axial vector channel um, has to vanish. And uh, the starting point in the vacuum are, are these correlation functions here. So you see the row measured experimentally, uh, basically, so the vector channel and the axial vector channel uh, coming from these uh, tau decay data. And also conclude that uh, chiral restoration has to manifest itself through mixing of vector and axial vector correlators. So they need to change in a very specific way, which I uh, want to show you here. So at low temperatures and densities, uh, that means for a dilute pion gas, basically, you can apply a chiral reduction and current algebra to find this mixing theorem here, where epsilon uh, is proportional to the temperature squared. And you can uh, then increase the temperature and see that, for example, the vector correlator immediate, immediately gets some contribution from the axial vector correlator. And if you play this game, to its full extent, of course, then the formula breaks down, but you can in principle here set epsilon to one half, so complete mixing. Then you get this uh, red line in this plot by Ralph Rapp again, where you then have a degeneration between rho and A1 and the complete mixing. So you may expect in this dip region of the rho an increase 
of the strength, which may then also show up in, in dilepton spectra. And you can also work out the dileptons um, with this epsilon parameter and see how they change with increasing temperature. Okay, um, so now I want slowly to come to uh, some of my own results, which were obtained together with Jochen Bambach and Lorenz Monsmekal in particular, based on the FRG, so the functional renormalization group. I don't want to into, go into the details here. Let me just say that the FRG is a, is a non-perturbative framework, in particular used in quantum field theory and statistical physics. Uh, the central object here is this gamma, which is the effective action, which is something like the classical action at high energies. And then you solve this flow equation here, the so-called Wetterich equation. Uh, you have to use some regulator function R. And in this way, you then include fluctuations from all scales uh, to towards lower energies until you reach K equals zero here and obtain your full quantum effective action. So this implements Wilson's uh, coarse graining idea. Fluctuations are successively in integrated out. And one advantage here is that the FRG properly deals with phase transitions at finite temperature and density. And we are also able to calculate spectral functions because we can do an analytic continuation from this Euclidean framework to Minkowski space time. So from imaginary to real energies. Okay, um, what we did recently was we used a parity doublet model as an input for this FRG approach. And here you see um, basically the Lagrangian or the effective action that we used. So we have the nucleons, which are N1, and the parity partners of the nucleons, which is N2, which is the N star 1535, which can interact with mesons and vector mesons. So in particular, the sigma, the pions, the rho and the A1. And one important new aspect is also here that we use a formulation in terms of field strength. This formulation was uh, developed for the FRG by Chris Jung and Lorenz von Smekal, which allows us to also uh, describe interactions um, with vector mesons dynamically. Yeah, um, the particular benefit also of this uh, parity doublet model is that it can account for a finite nucleon mass in a chirally invariant way. And it is actually a good idea to have uh, such a parity doubling, which uh, you can also see in these uh, lattice results here by Gerd Arts and collaborators. So they were looking here at the uh, Euclidean correlator ratios for the nucleon and its negative parity partner, this N star 1535. And uh, the slope here tells you about the mass. So uh, uh, a steeper slope corresponds to a larger mass. And you see here these gray points basically in the vacuum or at low temperatures uh, where the mass of the parity partner is very large. But if you increase the temperature here at uh, 1.9 TC, you see that the red points look very much alike. So here the mass becomes very similar, which means that the mass splitting burns off at high temperatures, but the ground state mass basically remains. So this uh, does not come from chiral symmetry breaking, but from some other QCD effect like the gluon condensate probably. Okay, so these results very nicely indicate that we have uh, this parity doubling above TC due to the restoration of chiral symmetry. So we did this with the FRG, and here you see some results on the thermodynamics. So on the left plot, you have the masses of the different particles, so pion sigmas, rows, A1, nucleon, and this N star 1535, parity partner, plotted here versus baryon chemical potential at rather low temperatures. And on the right, you have the phase diagram. So we are uh, on the left plot, we are here on a horizontal line at 10 MeV temperature crossing both of these phase transitions. Um, we cross the critical endpoint at about 900 MeV chemical potential here and you see the expected effects. And the second jump here is really the first order chiral phase transition at these higher chemical potentials. And here you see uh, nicely that the, the masses of the nucleon and its parity partner become almost degenerate, right? So there is a, a large drop here in the mass of the parity partner and they become very similar. 
Same for pion and sigma, of course. Okay, um, so to get to the spectral functions, we computed first the two-point functions, which are the inverse propagators. And I just show you here the flow equations in diagrammatic form. So you can also see which kind of processes uh, we have included here. In particular, we have included processes involving vector mesons in the loops, which is again due to this new formulation in terms of field strength. The vertices we just get from the effective action, so they don't carry any particular internal structure. And these flow equations we can then analytically continue to real energies and solve numerically. Let me just spend one slide uh, to show you how this analytic continuation works. So in principle, you have many ways to continue these equations, but only one way is the correct one, which is this one. So you need to do these steps in this way and in this order. First, you just drop all Euclidean energies appearing in uh, occupation number factors, and then you just substitute all remaining Euclidean energies by this real frequency omega in the usual way. So you get the retarded two-point function from the Euclidean two-point function, and then it's easy to get the spectral function as the imaginary part of the propagator. Okay, um, so here you see some results for the spectral functions of the rho and the A1 in the vacuum on the left. So you have in blue the rho spectral function and in yellow here the A1, which uh, look almost like expected. Uh, the rho is still a bit too sharp, but we are working on that. And you can also identify which decay channels give rise to all these interesting structures here. So of course the rho peak is generated by pion decay. And then at higher energies, you have rho into A1 and pion. And at very high energies, you have uh, rho decaying into nucleon, antinucleon. Um, for the A1, you have the corresponding channels here, similar. So A1 can decay into sigma and the pion, rho pion, A1 sigma, and nucleon, antinucleon. OK. Um, our main message uh, from this paper and maybe of this talk today uh, are these plots here. So we computed the spectral functions at the chiral critical endpoint, which corresponds to these values in temperature and chemical potential here. And aside from a progressing restoration uh, of chiral symmetry and degeneration of the spectral functions, we observe a very interesting peak here at the lower energies for these uh, calculations, it is at about 200 MeV, which is due to the process, as you see here on the right, when looking at this imaginary part of the two-point function again, due to the process of N star resonance production. So the rho captures or combines with the nucleon in the heat bath and produces the resonance, so N star 1535, uh, which gives then rise to this uh, strong enhancement here. And the same is also true for the A1. So since uh, rho and A1 become uh, degenerate, the same process is here at the same uh, location. And the, the value of 200 MeV basically tells you that the mass difference of nucleon and N star is about that value, so 200 MeV. Okay, if, if chiral symmetry is completely restored, the mass difference will be zero and this peak will be at zero. We also see uh, some other effects. For example, this blue peak here is uh, from really a critical fluctuation. So here the A1 captures a sigma, goes into a pion. And this is possible only at the critical endpoint because there the sigma is almost massless. And so it can be captured by some A1 off-shell resonance and produce a pion, which gives rise to this peak. But this peak is uh, actually uh, rather lower than the nucleon resonance production peak here. Okay, so this of course have di has direct consequences on the dileptons, on the dilepton rate. So I'm showing you here a preliminary calculation of the thermal dilepton rate based on these uh, spectral functions I've shown you. So we used here the Weldon formula in some simplified way. And indeed the same peak that I have discussed this nucleon resonance production peak also shows up in the dilepton rates. So this is a, a unique prediction of the parity doublet model, since the location of the peak depends um, on the mass difference of nucleon and parity partner, which is 
uh, very small here when chiral symmetry gets restored. And of course, it also has experimental consequences or, or may have experimental consequences because its detection uh, would yield strong evidence in support of the parity doublet scenario as providing the mechanism for chiral symmetry restoration in dense nuclear matter. <clears throat> and there is also another consequence um, because if you have a lot of N star 1535 states, you probably will also see an enhanced yield in the ETAs. Okay, so when you look at the decay channels of the N star 1535, you see that N eta is one of the main channels. So if you have a lot of if you have a lot of N stars, you probably also have a lot of etas. And we actually put this hypothesis to the test, or Lawrence von Smekal and Alexei Larionov um, did the calculations here. They actually uh, used parity doubling also in a transport code in Gibu, so Gießen, Boltzmann, Uhling, Uhlenbeck transport code, um, where instead, uh, I skipped this slide, where instead of the usual formulation of the fields, which just uh, depend um, monotonically and um, as you see here on the density, so the red, Dotted line here is the standard uh, formulation, which is generally used for nucleon and N star, where you, the masses just decrease with increasing density. But what they did is they used the parity doubling uh, formulation, which is the blue dashed line here. Okay. And here you see in particular the mass of the N star drops rather quickly with increasing density. And this has consequences uh, for the observed particles. Um, namely, it leads to an enhancement of the N star 1535 production in the intermediate stages of central heavy ion collisions at one AGV, which is what they did. And this then um, reflects in the plots you see here. So on the left, you have the resulting dilepton rate. And on the right, you have the rapidity dependence. <clears throat> so if we look on the left, you can compare the red dashed line, which is this parity doubling scenario with the blue dashed line. Okay, so this is the row into E plus E minus channel. And you see the red line is higher than the blue line. So this is exactly such a peak that we have proposing, uh, that we were proposing in the paper that you have an increased yield here also in the dileptons at low energies. And you also see this even more clearly here on the right, uh, on the rapidity dependence also um, in the row E plus E minus channel. So the red line is higher than the blue line comparing parity doubling with standard formulation. And you also see this increase in the ETAs if you look very closely. So if you compare the yellow line here with the green line, even there you see some enhancement. So there is really some possibility that this could be observed experimentally. Okay, um, coming now to different approaches to compute uh, vector meson spectral functions. One very successful approach is hadronic many body theory. So this is based on effective hadronic Lagrangians where the parameters are kept constant and are constrained by empirical information. And on the right here, you see some typical results by Ralf Rapp and collaborators uh, where you see the row spectral function in the medium at this baryon chemical potential here and increasing temperatures. So you see the green line in the vacuum and then you see what happens when you increase the temperature. So the rho spectral function really melts uh, down and you also have a lot of strength here at lower masses. And in comparison, you also see what happens if you don't include the baryons, then the melting happens in a very different way and not so strongly. So you really need the baryons at finite chemical potential to get a correct description. And uh, the typical propagate in this formulation then uh, looks like here you see on the left, so you have the row mass, and then you have all kinds of contributions to the self energy. So the typical pion cloud and uh, meson contributions and baryon contributions. And uh, this was also very successful already in the past to describe experimental data so for example, when we look at the low mass dileptons at Ceres, which you see here on the right, you see that uh, this data is very well described 
by using uh, these dilepton uh, computations based on hadronic many body theory row spectral functions. So uh, the in medium row spectral function with baryonic effects is needed. And then this is in very good, even quantitative agreement. The same is true for these uh, high precision NA60 data, which you see down here. So again, you are, you see the comparison with the full model here, but also with the computation without baryons, which then fails to describe the data. So you really need these baryons in there. And due to this precision, uh, you are also able to extract a temperature here, which I will come back to. Okay, uh, another way is to combine these calculations, for example, with sum rules, QCD and chiral sum rules, which was done here uh, by Ralf Rapp and uh, collaborators. So you see the in black, the row spectral function, which was computed using this uh, hadronic many body theory, but then the A1, so the red line was actually obtained by just using constraints from some rules. And then you get some estimate here for different temperatures and you can see nicely how rho and A1 behave and how they actually degenerate at very high temperatures due to the restoration of chiral symmetry. Okay, uh, coming to applications. So we can use dileptons as a thermometer. If we look, for example, in the intermediate mass regime, um, you can approximately describe the dilepton rates uh, by this formula. So you see here, so the Boltzmann factor with some uh, pre-factor depending on mass and temperature. This is, of course, independent of the flow. So there are no blue shift effects, which you, for example, have in photon um, calculations. And if you do this for the NA60 data, I've just shown you, you get a temperature of 205 MeV, which is in fact the only explicit temperature measurement above TC in heavy ion collisions. However, this represents an average over the fireball evolution. So the initial temperature is even higher. And you see some model calculation, uh, for example, here, where in purple, you have the initial temperature in red, we have this average temperature, which I have discussed, and you see how they depend with the collision energy. And then uh, there is this idea of getting signals or signatures for phase transitions by looking at a plot like this, also experimentally. So when you plot the, these uh, extracted temperatures versus the, versus the collision energy, you get a plot like you see here, which uh, Tatiana compiled, in comparison again to these model calculations by Ralf. And uh, you see how the expected line looks and where the data points are. So if you add more and more data points, decrease the errors, the uncertainties, then you may be able to see a deviation from this red dashed line because there may be uh, a first order phase transition where latent heat has to be burned off, which may lead to a flattening or a plateau of this curve. Okay, another possibility is to use uh, dileptons as a chronometer so we can learn about the lifetime of the fireball by looking in particular in the low mass regime where contributions from both hadronic and QGP are relevant. And uh, again, you see a model calculation here on the right where in purple, you have the total uh, integrated radiation again versus collision energy compared to the lifetime. So you see they look uh, very alike. So this seems to be a good way to track the lifetime of the fireball. And again, you can also do this experimentally. So you can compile such a plot as you see here below. Of course, um, <clears throat> we here also need to uh, decrease the uncertainties and add more points. But eventually, uh, you may be able to see also here some particular effects coming possibly from the critical endpoint in the QCD phase diagram, since at this point, the system uh, may experience critical uh, slowing down and more radiation would be generated around. So there may be some kind of peak in such a diagram. Okay, um, coming to the polarization. So we can also use dileptons as a polarimeter by looking at the angular distribution of the dilepton rate. And by this, we can learn uh, for example, about the production mechanism. 
So the, the angular distribution of the rate looks like this, which depends on anisotropic coefficients lambda. And uh, this was computed here by Enrico Speranza and collaborators. So you see these uh, anisotropic coefficients uh, for different processes, QQ bar and pion annihilation um, for different expanding media. And you see that uh, they look different. So depending on the production process, you get a different distribution, a different polarization. So you can use this information uh, in principle also experimentally to learn about the production mechanism of these dileptons and possibly separate the different channels. I will soon conclude. Um, one point here is, is also that uh, virtual photons from an unpolarized thermal source are indeed polarized due to these uh, production channels. Okay, um, I think the last topic I want to show you is electrical conductivity. Um, this is a very difficult quantity to compute. On the right here, you see um, different approaches to compute the electrical conductivity of a pion gas basically. Um, versus temperature, and some people here have contributed. So Karl Frapp is here, uh, Moritz Kreif has left, I believe, uh, physics. And I also show you one calculation from the FYG, which was done recently um, by a master student I co-supervised in Frankfurt, which is this brown line. And uh, what we did was uh, use this formulation that you see here. So you can define the electrical conductivity as the low energy limit of the EM spectral function. Okay, so uh, zero spatial momentum and uh, zero energy, which also means of course that you can possibly get this from experiment by looking at the very low mass, low PT range in dileptons and possibly also photons. Okay, uh, I think I have to conclude. Um, so let me summarize. I hope I convinced you that the dileptons provide a wide range of insights on the created medium. You can get basic kinematic information like fireball temperature, degree of collectivity, and lifetime, but you can also get dynamical information. Um, I've shown you that in medium spectral functions encode also uh, changes in degrees of freedom and chiral symmetry restoration, but we can also learn about transport coefficients like the electrical conductivity. We have seen uh, that the rho meson melts in a strongly interacting hadronic medium, indicating a transition in degrees of freedom towards QQ bar continuum and uh, compatible with chiral restoration, of course. And I've also mentioned that uh, the ground state mass is actually not so much affected by chiral symmetry restoration, but that uh, the mass of the parity partners, for example, decreases drastically. So the mass splitting burns off but the ground state mass remains and is probably generated by the gluon condensate or similar effects. Okay, um, as an outlook, there are new theoretical developments coming up, for example, from FRG and Lattice QCD, which will provide realistic and thermodynamically consistent in medium vector meson spectral functions. And of course, we also have um, a lot of running and upcoming exper experiments, which will help also to identify phase transitions and possibly critical endpoints. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for the overview of the theory. So questions? Um, yeah, you have a question here. Yeah, so uh, the question is Thanks, Arno, for the talk. Maybe we can go to the comparison between uh, GIS and BUU model and experimental data. So what I see here is that there is a very strong effect on the rho meson, even larger than on the eta meson. My question would be, what is really assumed here for the coupling of the rho to N1535? It seems to be absolutely or too strong to me. I even do not find now in the particle data booklets that there is even such a coupling of rho to n star 1535. So okay, I, I don't think I know the details of this computation, sorry. Okay, so, but maybe we can ask also right on this. So. Very weak 
There is not much raw, right? So, okay, good. So maybe it is something to be still. Can I say understand. directly something on that? Oh yeah, Uli Mosel is there. Yeah, yeah sure. sure. It's this coupling of uh, row to the 1535 and 1520 you were asking about. And it was, inter indeed, the history is interesting because uh, about uh, 20 years ago or so, the PDG had a partial decay width of the 1520 to row of about 20%. Okay, and then uh, in between that decay, partial decay width disappeared from the PDG, and then it reappeared again in the web version with the haters value. And right now they are still doing something on that. Now, the latest results we have are from partial wave analyses. And one is the bon Gacina analysis. They get a partial width of the 1520 of about 12% and nothing or 1% for the 1535. However, there is another very broadly based uh, partial wave analysis by Hunt and Menley around two years old. And they have also a 12% for 1520, but they also have a 12% for 1535. And since the data usually can't distinguish between 1535 and 1520, you know, both of them together are the old value of 21 mm -hmm. or so, which we have in GBU since 30 years based on the old PDG values. So that's okay. the present situation. Okay, good. So, but maybe one could just check the update on this 1535, right? Because yeah, one could, N1520, one could I fully agree with you on, about N1520, but that's what I understood is not this particular discussion here, and it was more on 1535, and there I'm yeah. not so sure about this coupling. Of yeah, this, is, this is true. In the old analyses, there was never any row coupling for the 1535. Uh, then Bongacina had a 1% or something like that branching ratio. But then Hunt and Menley has an 11% in there. And Hunt and Menley use a wider database. So it cannot be discarded right away. So, uh, yeah. OK, thanks. Uh, maybe next, uh, Chihiro Sasaki. Yeah, OK, thank you very much. Um, I have a technical question concerning your FLG computation. So I see that uh, it was based on the linear realization of chiral symmetry. And then I am more familiar with nonlinear realization. And then in this case, it's well known that there is no unique set of logic constants which satisfy three or four uh, different relations, which are uh, all known as a low energy theorem for uh, the vector meson simultaneously. So I wonder what's going on in your linear uh, treatment. Are they all satisfied simultaneously at any energy scale, at any temperature or density? Well, that's a good question. I don't think we actually checked these uh, low energy theorems mm -hmm. explicitly. Yeah, it would be good if you could further check uh, the, yeah. the fate of those low energy constants, in particular, the fate of vector meson dominance near the chiral transition. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you for you. this uh, comment. Next, Johanna Stachel, please. Yeah, I was wondering, you made twice this comment that as the chiral mixing uh, occurs, the mass of the ground state remains unchanged. And I'm wondering what the meaning of this is. I mean, there are many indications on the lattice that there's also a deconfinement transition. So what is in this light the meaning of the, the nucleon mass or the raw mass stays? Yeah, well, the, the meaning of, or what, what we can say at this point, I guess, is that it is that the ground state mass is not due to chiral symmetry for sure in this case. So it must be some other QCD interaction, possibly the gluon condensate. Yeah, I heard your words, but I wonder what this means when you have chiral restoration, which is not, not part of your picture, right? Uh, when you have deconfinement. Right, so in my computation, I don't have uh, confinement, deconfinement. Right. You That's true. Just the chiral phase transition, right? But yeah, but uh, I mean, I can only refer to these lattice computations where you see this effect. And then the next question is how to interpret this effect, of course. Yeah, but on the lattice, these are screening masses, right? 
And if I may, I have another question, and that is, uh, you mentioned the only true temperature measurement above TC as an important feature of NA60. I'm wondering, somebody would have to do a computation of Trillian in this mass and PT range so that this could be a solid conclusion. And uh, of course, this is much easier at high energies at the LHC because the cross-section drops like one over S, but certainly at SPS energy, this uh, would deserve some attention. Okay, yes, right. Okay, thank you very much. I uh, think we should uh, thank Arnold here for, for the presentation. We have to go on and uh, yeah, please. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much, Tatiana, for getting the talk and up. And also, I would like to thank very much to the organizers for having me here to talk about dileptons. And that is a very interesting workshop. And it is one of a series. And that makes me very happy to be here. So the role of my talk is to review experimental results on dileptons. Of course, that in 35 minutes, I cannot cover everything. I will put a focus again on thermal radiation. There will be some overlap also with the talk we had before. No signal. So should I continue or should I wait until? The sound is okay. Only your photo Slides is gone. gone. Only the camera is gone. Okay, so. I mean, as an experimentalist, uh, if I go to the lepton spectroscopy, I'm nothing. I'm not doing anything more than following an advice by Richard Feynman. Namely, if you want to study hydronic system, better use a probe, electromagnetic probe, which is understood. So that's what we want to do here. And there's a list of topics I would like to touch. Uh, I, have, I will start with some phenomenology. I think this is important if one wants to understand how these dilepton spectra come uh, about. Some little history here, and then the other topics more or less you have already heard. But I also have a short section here on cold matter and vacuum physics even. Although I should say, I already now make advertisement for the talk of uh, Piotr Salabura. I think it's on Thursday. He will go much more deep uh, in, into that topic. So the lepton spectroscopy by now has quite some history. So I will touch more or less experimental results for all these groups, which are shown here. And you might know originally this dilepton spectro spectroscopy started out using typically two arm spectrometers. But by the time as uh, instrumentation technology improved, uh, we basically made all the way to have multi-purpose detectors down here and with micro tracking, be it with muon detection or electron uh, detection doesn't matter. For some time, it was also the belief that uh, you can die electron spectroscopy only do if you have a field free region with a Cherenkov detector. But as a, you have heard, that CBM things can also do it here with the electrons. So, introduction uh, the phase diagram, yet another version. I will not go in any detail here. I think you are all experts. What I would like to point out is that. If we discuss um, dilepton spectroscopy, we also discuss very often Carl symmetry restoration. The situation here at New B Siri, you know very well, there's a crossover with this pseudo critical uh, temperature, 154 or so. And uh, I also would like to emphasize that there are calculations possible here, of course, not uh, lattice QCD. This is a uh, let's say chiral perturbation theory type uh, calculation using all the FHG flow equations or to get some understanding maybe of what the Carl condensate does in this region. This is the region actually covered by cis-18 energies, lower cis-100 energies. And you see there is some kind of a depletion, but that is not so strong. I think I can show you a result which would more emphasize that there might be already a substantial uh, depletion of the condensate. So that is the lower bound here. This is this 18 energy, so GSI physics, Hades, and the upper bound is here, these or the collider experiments also at Rick. 
So the phenomenology of heavy ion collisions, I mean, you all know that you're experts, but I, I would still spend a few uh, words on that. I mean, that's our so-called standard model. We collide uh, two heavy nuclei, they interpenetrate. So we have an initial stage, which is a non-equilibrium stage, which is at collider energies, maximum collider energy is very short in time, is more or less instant less than Fermi over C uh, thermalization, then you go into kind of a, a thermalized system, but there might also be corona effects. So not, I mean, not very homogeneous meeting, one should, uh, medium, one should keep this in mind, uh, which might be protonic at the beginning and turns over to hadronic. Then there is this famous freeze out, chemical freeze out, and later a, a thermal freeze out. And that's what we finally observe in the detector. So, if we really want to study nuclear matter, QCD matter under extreme conditions, of course, we, we want to focus here on this region, namely the thermalized hot and dense system. In order to get the signal from that phase, of course, we have to subtract contribution from the early stage and from the late stage, because the spectrometers can only integrate over time and volume. So there is no way, other direct way to disentangle that. And I will a little bit discuss how one can achieve this in, in experiment. I should also say that while this later stage might not be so different if you go to top energy or so PEV or to GEV, the initial state, of course, this uh, pre-equilibrium state is much different. And mostly already because, first of all, interpenetration time is much different because the gamma factor is not very large at low energy. So there's some time you need for the nuclei to interpenetrate. That is not the case at high energies. Moreover, of course, the associated wavelengths dramatically shrinks. That means if you go uh, have a collider experiment, what you essentially do is you make here collisions of lots of gluons with lots of gluons while the quarks escape through the beam pipe. So you create a system with the quantum numbers of the vacuum. You have a lot of protonic high uh, momentum processes, which produce dileptons here. If I now go to cis-18 energies, we really collide nucleons and nucleons and uh, primary collisions are nucleons going to resonance and then that takes some time. So uh, there is even in the immediate region where perturbative, uh, calculations for this kind of pre-equilibrium initial state radiation would not work anymore, but which are yet already on of platonic uh, character. So that is something one in future maybe has to keep an eye on by doing reference measurements, also maybe from theory's point of view, in order to get a better control uh, of this uh, situation. I said that the fireball, I mean, this kind of freeze out uh, conditions are not so different. I show here two versions of uh, trying to explain measured hadron yields using the uh, statistical hadronization model. You all know this graph here on the Alice group. Uh, this is actually a picture from Johanna and co co-workers nature paper, which demonstrate with almost essentially one parameter temperature because mu b is pretty much zero. You can explain yields over eight, nine orders of magnitude. I mean, this is really very, very interesting. The message for me at the moment here is in this scenario at freeze out, you have typically 10 pines per baryon. So that's the situation at freeze out. It's very meson dominated uh, fireball at the freeze out. Here is a version, which is one version, I should say, that is maybe not yet such a unique explanation available because we have canonic suppression of um, strangeness. Yet you get quite good fits. And this is also to show Uli Mosel. I mean, even the pines come out very well. So even so transport has a problem here. The thermal model can explain the pine yields. And uh, what I should say here is that the typical concentration, let's say of pines is one pine per 10 baryons roundabout. So that is indeed a difference, but otherwise it's pretty simple. So I come back to this high mu b region. And for my discussion, I would like to yeah, convey here a picture of what happens if you take nucleons now and have a fireball which is baryon dominated but compressed. I mean, you know that the 
baryons, they interact with each other through a pine cloud or meson cloud. And the range is given by the pine mass, the maximum range. Now, if you have an excitation, a temperature in the pine cloud, of course, this effective mass is lower because you have extra energy. You don't have to take everything from the vacuum to produce a virtual pine. So you can imagine that the clouds more and more start to overlap. So that's in the dense phase. And what we actually probe is putting now in such a medium where you have like an entangled big pine cloud or meson cloud, you put our vector meson, our probe, a virtual photon, and according to vector meson dominance, that mainly couples to Rho meson, we just heard that. Then we, yeah, we probe actually such an entangled meson cloud, which has baryonic cores all around. So that's a good picture to understand what we do. Now, the canonical dilepton invariant mass spectrum, then that's the one which is integrated, typically can be divided in different regions, low mass region, everything below the low mass vector mesons here on that side, let's say below 800 or so MeV, and the intermediate mass region. Now coming back to the initial state radiation, if you go to high energies, you have high momentum, I mean, partonic interactions. Most importantly, is Strel Young, and there's also charm production, which eventually later thermalizes. Nevertheless, it's produced in the initial state. This can contribute on a different level, depending on what energy you have. This is a 20 HEV calculation, where, of course, Strel Young cross-section is not so well known, nor D bar D. Nevertheless, it's only to show, to demonstrate, and it was mentioned, if you are out now to have a good measurement of thermal radiation in this region, which also turns out to come more from the initial state, it's the hotter phase of this evolution, then you have to control very well contributions from Trell Young and open charm production. While open charm production at some point dies out, Trell Young is a more complicated case because on the platonic level, it's well known how to do that uh, as a factorization of the uh, partner distribution function and basically the interaction. So you can very well calculate this, but now if you go soft and softer, if you go down with the beam energy, you're not so clear anymore what you have to do here. That can even be like pionic trail young. So you have a cloud pine interacting with the cloud pine, produces some radiation and that eventually has to be calculated to some precision. So that is certainly a challenge. The other part is the cocktail. So this is the late stage. And uh, the late stage typically, at least at higher energy, is meson dominated. So mesons you can measure by other means. So you can have a good control on the meson contribution. So this is everything decaying after freeze out. Also the thermal model gives the guidance here if it's working so well. But at the lower energies, again, there is a contribution also maybe from baryonic parts here from the initial state. So this is something I will also discuss. So this initial time and the two nuclei interpenetrate, of course, you can also have contributions to the spectrum. And this is also in this low mass region. So uh, a little historical excursion. So establishing excess radiation at Bevelac, I mean, this is a bit how, how it started, at least from the point of view of the low energies. So when we started with Hades, uh, we did reference measurements for exactly that reason that we wanted to understand the contribution from the initial state. And there came a surprise because uh, it turns out that neutron proton interactions look much different then a proton proton interaction. And that was not really so clear. Of course, there is a dipole moment in a neutron proton, which you don't have in the proton proton, there's only a quadrupole moment. So that makes some more radiation. But uh, it turns out that you can all also have radiation from the internal line. If you have a pi uh, proton neutron interaction, you can have a charged pine exchange. And this charged internal pine line can radiate uh, dileptons, vector meson dominance. That was included in the actually two calculations here, and that gives gave a somewhat good description. But you see, still there's kind of a bump, and I will come back to that because this is already the first sign of a Romeson existing here in the cloud of a baryon. So it's, it's a part of the baryon resonance, which can be mapped on an off-shell Romeson plus a core. So and taking this proper 
uh, background or let's say this reference into account, we could then uh, explain uh, our carbon-carbon measurements very well in terms of basically nuclear nucleon collisions. And we could also demonstrate that our measurement is the same result than DLS because we had large acceptance. We folded in the DLS acceptance and we saw the same yield. So this is uh, now shown here, it comes back later. So you measure your dilepton invariant mass distribution. That's what you get in total, but now, we subtract here this initial state radiation, which is scaled up to our part, if you like, and then we still see an excess radiation, which we at that time said is something on top, whether there is some eta, which is not understood, but I should say that this, this low energies, there is eta very much suppressed since anyhow in this background calculation subtracted. So that was, let's say, a first side to the meson of a raw meson, but of course it is much more known than by now. I show you the series measurement. Also here for the first time was a strong axis seen over the mesonic cocktail, which comes here as a line, which is well determined by many contributions and a huge filled up region here at in, not in the immediate mass, the mass around four or 500 MeV. And with this atronic many body calculation, a la Ralph Rapp and Jochen Bambach, it was demonstrated that you can understand this radiation as due to radi I mean, row mesons, off shell row mesons radiating out of the fireball. And it could even be demonstrated that most likely you need uh, to invoke this coupling to baryonic resonance in order to make the row sufficiently broad. This, however, later of course, was much more emphasized with this fantastic result from the NA60 diamond measurement with very good statistics for the first time, really very good statistics, good resolution. And I don't need to go to all the discussion again. You subtract uh, your combinatorial background and you see some excess radiation where you have subtracted phi and omega contributions. You still see here some row like shape, which I think you can interpret as late or high momentum uh, row mesons, but you see this broad bump here. And that again could be demonstrated. This is a broadened row and it is not a shifted row, very important. So that was discussed before in the talk. I don't want to go again. I mean, that is the thermal radiation, the current, current correlator, the Fourier transform, the imaginary part. It was shown that essentially at the end of the day, what you have to take into account is the in medium Rho meson propagator, which you proper, properly dress up. First of all, the pine loop. I mean, the Rho meson is basically a pi pi state that can couple to delta hole excitations, even on both legs. And very important also is this direct absorption of the Rho on the nucleon resonance hole state. So this loop here, that is the one which makes the strength at low mass. And now I compare this to this picture I showed at the beginning with this overlaying cloud. So that graph here is nothing but a row mass of propagating here through the cloud and crossing by to this baryonic course. This is exactly what, what is shown here. And that's what we are measuring if we are in this hadronic phase. So now having this uh, toolkit, so to say, this thermal radiation, one can try to interpret this excess radiation in terms of thermal radiation, and that is how this is done. Again, here is like a Boltzmann factor. There is this in medium propagator and, and uh, some factors before, lepton tensor, things like that. At the end of the day, that all boils down to the ability of, of a chunk of matter to radiate uh, dileptons with a given four momentum Q. And this emissivity depends on the temperature of the medium, biochemical potential, and of course, eventually also on this collective velocity in, in the frame where you measure it, right? So you integrate that and then you get the thermal contribution to the spectrum. The question is now, how do you know which temperature mu B you have at which time and which place in the fireball? There are different ways. You can make simplified expansion models, you can take hydro, or you take URQMD or any other transport microscopic transport code and you coarse grain, meaning you run many, many, many collisions. You take averages in each space time cell, and you also get then kind of an expansion 
model for the for the fireball, which gives you new BT at any time and position. So that's what you do, and you fold it with the uh, emissivity, and then you get your thermal uh, dilepton spectrum. The beauty of that procedure is suppose you really understand your emissivity, basically with the spectral distribution and also with the PT distribution, the yield and everything, you control the trajectory of your fireball in the phase, use the phase diagram. So this is why people like to call this the standard candle. So if that is really known, this emissivity, then you have a, a direct method to trace where your fireball is propagating in the QCD phase diagram. And that uh, method works very well. That was also demonstrated with the NA60 data. I would like to emphasize again, it was just shown also that invoking this baryonic effect to the in medium spectral function, only then you can explain the low mass, measured low mass yield here. Uh, and the other point uh, also addressed already, if you now go and want to understand the in the mass mass re, uh, region in terms of thermal radiation, you have to have control over Trail Young and Open Charm. Open Charm, if you have a good vertex detector, you can check for off primary vertex, basically production of your dimuons, or in that case, muons, two muons, then you can get a handle, a better handle on the contribution. Then you are able eventually to, sub, to extract the thermal part. And what was done here is basically fitting. I mean, basically a slope. So this is a slope parameter, the T effective, you plot it. And you see here in the low mass region, a typical behavior of hadronic species decaying, and they go pseudo hotter, the more massive they are. And there is a drop and that looks like an early emission where you have less uh, collective motion yet, although a higher temperature, which brings the effective temperature down. So that tells you by looking to the regions of invariant mass, you also have a handle on whether you are basically more in the early fa phase of this evolution or maybe more in the late phase. Now I come to the hardest data. So of course here, temperature is lower. And uh, I mean, vector mesons is truly a rare probe because the production probability of making a meson order 800 MeV is 10 to the minus two or so. On top, you have a 10 to the minus five uh, branching ratio order. So you're already 10 to the minus seven, roughly. That means you have to have 10 million reactions observed to see one row meson decaying into a dilepton. So this is really not an easy measurement. So what you see here is, uh, check the time. Oh, it's okay. So you see uh, the measured foreground or the like sign, unlike sign pair spectrum, you subtract the combinatorial part, the blue one, and then you get the signal, so to say, that's this one. And now very important is uh, how do we extract now here excess radiation? Of course, we do the Masonic cocktail, but this is a bit more easy, let's say, because we are not at, not meson dominate, not so high temperature as freeze out. You see ma mainly the Eda Dalits here, you see some Omega contribution, of course, Pi Dalits. But you see also that we put this data points here. This is now our estimate for the contribution of this early penetration phase, so scaled up uh, yield using our elementary reference measurements, PP and NP exactly at the same energy. But you see even that one, there's still a huge yield above. So now we subtract basically the Masonic cocktail and this reference part as we call it, and then you get a spectrum which looks like that. And that came as a big surprise because that looks almost exponential as a function of invariant mass. If you now were go make a naive simulation, let's say take a transport and a vacuum row, you would expect to see a bump here. Even if you invoke some melting of the row, you would still expect that there is some increase here. So basically from the, if you make rows in the region, which are not so dense in the, in the, in the cascade uh, description, but to really make it flat, you only get it if you use a coarse grained transport code and you use emissivities as we discussed them before from many body uh, nuclear or hadronic theory. So that's different versions of that. 
you can even do something else. You can just fit this curve here with a Planck-like uh, formula and you get temperature right out of that. And that only works because I showed you the calculation of the thermal rate. Of course, you have the in medium propagator and you have the, the Boltzmann factor. But if the in medium propagator is structureless, more or less constant, then you can just read off the Boltzmann factor, the temperature, and that's what's done here. And the number which comes out is 70 MV, 72 MeV. Then Ralph, he, what he did, he found out that when he first mapped out basically this emissivity as a function of mu BT, it was done for Na60. And there the fireball does not really go so often in this region, which is relevant for Hardes. So he made a much finer calculation of the emissivity also in this region relative for the hardest fireballs, let's put it that way. And then you get out this calculation, the blue one, and that goes really impressively through the data. So how is this dilepton radiation understood in this kind of coarse grade transport code? So the usual question is, the thing is not thermalized. Well, if you look to pressure, for example, which primarily done by the baryons, so that by the motion of the baryons, you can have the ratio here with some exponent. So this is this function here, defined here, which gives you the balance of longitudinal and uh, transverse pressure. Indeed, this is not one at the beginning, maybe up to seven Fermi over C. And this is more or less what I told you, what we try to describe is our reference measure, measurement. Temperature really sets in only here, and that's shown here, and uh, it goes up here. And this is also when the yield comes, right? This is the yield, integrated yield as, as function of time, integrated over the whole fireball. And you see that the, the em emission is roughly between, let's say, 8 Fermi over C and 20. So with 10 Fermi over C, you get all the thermal radiation. And this is exactly the time or the period of this reaction or fireball evolution when the, when the transverse the blast builds up, so to say. So that just falls in place. Nevertheless, even if your baryonic motion is not fully thermalized, if you go back to this picture of entangled pine cloud, it could well be that the pine cloud already is thermalized because as quantum entanglement, and this pine cloud is at the end relevant for the excitation spectrum of the baryon. So that basic can equilibrate excitation spectrum, even if the motion of the baryonic course is not yet fully thermalized. I think this is very important to understand this dilepton results. At the colliders, of course, their dileptons were also addressed, but this is, of course, a formidable task because we have a lot of pines produced, as I told you, 10 times more pines than baryons. And the pines with the Dallas decay, they give rise uh, to a huge background, which is not easy to control. Even if you have good statistics, the background is closed, so signal to background is not very good. Nevertheless, there are very nice measurements, which also established the excess yield. There is even now, of course, in a collider, a star could do an excitation function of the uh, excess radiation or thermal radiation. There's even a measurement from Alice already, and we all know with the upgrade ITS3, also at least we expect very, very nice dilepton spectra then also from, from LHC, LHC energies. So here, just to summarize the centrality aspect. So if you now make event classes according to centrality, you check for the amount of excess radiation in the data above cocktail. You see what is measured here from star or from Phoenix. And this red curve is again thermal model calculation by Ralph Rapp and co-workers. And it, I guess, gets the trend. So I think also there is already some more than an indication that this radiation is really this thermal radiation. This plot, I don't think I need to discuss again. If you are now sensitive to the immediate row, you are also sensitive to its broadening. I mean, this calculation is at mu B zero. So this is no baryonic effect inside, but only temperature. If you would make this with baryons also, that would be much more flat here. And that's what we see in Hardest. So we see actually, if, if all this interpretation is right, we see a completely flattened out row meson. You can say Carl symmetry more or less already restored. Of course, there's no proof. 
A better measurement would be to investigate the mass region one, uh, around one GV. So because here, as was also pointed out by Arnold, by Arnold, that you can see a difference eventually because of this rho A1 mixing. There was also yesterday a discussion that you can do much more with dialepton. Of course, you, there's a polarization. You have, of course, more degrees of freedom. If you measure three, a two lepton momenta, you have also an angle which you can de uh, determine. You can look to flow and even to electric conductivity. Here, I will be very brief because the main message here is that measurements are typically challenging and are very statistics hungry. You see here this result uh, in, in the uh, polarization of the virtual photo from NA60, which came out to be very small, if not completely vanishing. But it was said already that uh, even a thermalized fireball can show, because the quantum effects can show some uh, polarization, a small one, and it could well be that this is within the uncertainties here. If you go like hard as argon potassium chloride, Several mass spins, we see a strong polarization, but this is basically in the pion Dalitz region uh, as it is down here. And that's what you would expect there. But you also see from the gold data to really get good signals there, you need even more statistics. Same is with elliptic flow, which at low energies, again, I mean, elliptic flow is not really the signal you know from collider energies where you see this kind of conversion of pressure gradients to momentum space, so to say. Uh, here, it has to do with shadowing effects, mainly because the projectile target spectator, they pass by the fireball while the fireball uh, evolves, so to say. But this is, again, unfortunately, only done for pi zero dollars because of statistics. But then you see that the flow result we get out from, uh, from the pi zero dollars region by that dialectos matches more or less the one we see in the pions. So that is a consistency. Electric conductivity from experimental point of view is challenging. And that has to do some, some feedback here. So, uh, so it has to do with the fact that you cannot really go neither to low uh, zero PT nor to, nor to uh, zero mass. There's always some acceptance or hole yeah, where you cannot detect uh, dileptons. This is for hardest this case, and this is for the new version, ITS3. I mean, the scale is different, so this hole is more or less the same like here in hardest, so don't worry. Uh, yet you can try it out. There is a first try with hardest, making a cut at PT200. So this is going over here and projecting down, and that's what you get out. So this is something for the future. I think also experimentally more work has to be put into that to come really with I mean, substantial measurements of this part of the spectrum. So brief, hmm? what? I check it here. <laughs> no, I, I need two more. Okay, so this is cold matter. I just want to, uh, to remind that there is uh, also still a measurement or to, to try to measure line shapes of the more narrow vector mesons, phi or omega. Hardest tried with little statistics. So this is PP proto-niobium. If you interpret this spectrum, looks like omega is pretty much melted. KEK is now succeeded by JPAC measurement. We heard it yesterday, and we have to see and wait what they will find out. Now, this is important vacuum. I really would like to spend a minute on that, because now I go back to this um, loop here, this very important uh, loop uh, for the in medium spectral function of the row. If you cut this open here like that, you basically have a, a resonance Stalitz decay. Yeah, so that's what we do now with pine beam. You shoot pi minus in the proton, you form any resonance S channel like reaction. And then you make an exclusive measurement of the dilepton spectrum because you make a missing mass of the neutron. And you know that you have exactly seen pi minus proton goes to resonance. So the, the resonance makes a Dalit decay and the photon goes out. So that's what we measure. This is the dilepton invariant mass spectrum. And now you see this huge shoulder here, which I already indicated at the very beginning. Now, if you subtract the QED assumption so that this is a point-like vertex here, then you subtract this and then you see what's left over. And this is, you can call an effective transition form factor. And this is nothing 
but the vector meson dominance. You see here the low mass tail of the rho meson. So this is a proof that the assumption of vector meson dominance for baryonic processes is valid, right? And if you want to know more about that, then go to Piotr's talk because he will show you all the details because the decomposition is done based on the partial wave analysis going to the pi plus pi minus channel. So we can even tell which baryonic resonances are most dominant. I think it's no secret, it's 15, 20 here. Same works for delta here, this loop, pi cloud model by Teresa Pena, Ramalo. Same thing, you get here row like structures already in the delta. So, how many minutes for the future? No future? <laughs> okay, I mean, this I can skip. That was presented already. How to use dileptons to decode the QCD phase diagram at high UB. How you eventually spot first order phase transitions was all set. This graphs were discussed. I should like to show that one. This is a calculation some of the audience uh, members in the audience made using a hydro with an equation of state, which allows for first order phase transition, just to study what would be the effect of a phase transition. And here you see the ratio between the spectra. And you, I mean, the answer is here for short, could be a factor two more or less yield, depending on what equation of state you plug in. So there is a good chance to see actually in the yield and uh, the distribution of the yield an effect of a first order phase transition, this I skip. This we have also seen, there is quite a number of experiments at the horizon, and we are very happy that people all want to address dileptons because we think this is really a very beautiful tool and probe. Fair also does this, of course. So we have CBM, we have hardest, we have CBM much, so we can change the CBM detector from an electron machine in the muon machine that was discussed by Christoph yesterday. I can skip that. We go high rate, 100 kilohertz up to 10 megahertz with a dimuon option. Online event selection using a huge computer farm to be very sensitive. So triggering in that sense on mesons and uh, dimuons would be filtering dimuons in online analysis. And with that high rate, we should have really fantastic statistics. So I leave the challenges for future measurements of the electrons or the neurons for the discussion. I'm late, sorry. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> questions from the audience? Are there questions in the chat? It was a very comprehensive talk. <laughs> it could mean everything unclear or everything clear. <laughs> How much room is there for exotic physics? So, so you seem to have everything under control. Exotic, I mean. It's so let's say uh, there is an old idea that, uh, in, in particular, in the high baryon sector, you can have uh, diquark, anti diquark. So, if you, in particular, if you have a color superconducting phase, which would be, of course, something very exotic, uh, going into the row and then to be seen as some enhancement in the uh, in the dileptons. Yeah, this, is think, there room for that? I think this is more a question to theory because then you would. Yeah, yeah, we have calculate. to do homework, right? But uh, you have made an analysis of what you see already by Hardis, and uh, did you pin down the, the benchmarks uh, well enough to say, okay, such exotics is excluded, or is there still some room for. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, now gut feeling is if if you come up with effects which are on the level of 10 percent more or less in the thermal radiation it's going to be hard if there is not some other i mean observable like pt or whatever which would nail this down more effectively where you would have stronger effects right but uh, i mean 10 percent precision already is hard to get so i mean if you are below with your effect not sure you can detect that uh are there any uh, questions in the chat? Do we see that? Somebody raised hand? Okay, yes, Piotr, please. I have raised hand, not just not to comment and not to, to, to erase this impression that everything is well under control. I think really what is really needed, I think, and it's big question is just a proof of a with chiral restoration pictures. I mean, the challenge is really to make this raw A1 
mixing uh, as a signal I mean, that we really see this and that will require, I mean, some really work because first of all, I mean, in different energy regimes, the, just the reference spectrum exactly above one GV, I mean, as Joachim said, I mean, it, I mean, it depends on energy. The, I mean, the reference with respect to which we will search for this signal or really raw A1 is, is very different. So one has really to study, understand this, so that will already take some time. And one needs really a precision there. I mean, so for, for example, for hardest or, or refer energy, this um, energy region, which is here, it's mainly, I mean, produced by multi pion final state. And here the resonance, resonance scattering might play a role and, and, and all these things. So that is absolutely not trivial. Okay, thanks for the comment. Yeah, uh, maybe. It's just that maybe a curiosity on the mass shifts for the vector mesons in school matter. You, you showed these uh, results from E3 to 5. So uh, this seem to date back to 2007. And uh, let's say the statistics is not negligible. So what was the conclusion of that experiment? Of the CAC? Yeah. That, that there was yeah, I mean, there, there are two issues. There one, one, it was one statement about the Rho meson. I think that nobody supports anymore, that there was a shift of the Rho. I think we all understood that there was a problem in the background subtraction. Uh, that upper right one, I think this is the modulating spectrum for building up this new machine, which was introduced yesterday, right? At the J Park, the lepton spectrometer, because they see here that. Yeah, call it pale or whatever, which they claim they know very well that this is not radiative losses or whatever. And I think they want to remeasure that mainly, right? And we have to see because that, of course, such a tail. Now, you, if you make a model with cold matter, you can interpret this as a, a shifted phi integrated over the density profile of the nucleus. You, you can more or less extract here a mass shift. But as you see, that is the only spectrum and the, the crucial factor is always that the, the vector method should not be so fast because otherwise it's boosted out of the medium and you don't see an effect. This is why we could really go down to 800 and we would have loved to make this with good statistics, but we, beam time is not so plentifully available at GSI, but we could do that. From that not so good statistics, we have some indication that there's a strong melding of the omega. Well, the phi is not in principle, we can also do this for the phi. Yeah. But, but the medium is, is simply the nucleus. It's yeah, cold, it's, it's, it's cold it's, matter. So it's, but it's enough because we have already, mm. depending on what you assume, 30%, 20, 30% effect on the cryo oh, okay. say, yeah. depending on the model. So in principle, it's still a valid measurement. Yeah. I mean, but it needs also a lot of statistics to get the line shape properly done. Yeah. Okay, then let's thank Joachim for this nice talk. And at Trento at this workshop again, I don't know the how many of this series it is, but it has always been very inspiring. And after the hiatus we've all been through, I've, I find this very refreshing. So I, I will talk about direct photon measurements um, really at the other energy range, at, at the very high energy range. There aren't any low momentum measurement of, of late. And you know we attempted that at the SBS, um, but, but kind of fail to, to really produce results. Now, direct photons and dileptons are complementary. They have their strengths and weaknesses. Um, direct photons have one strength. They're easier to measure than direct dileptons, um, but they, they have other weaknesses. Okay, so I will um, give you a quick overview of previous results. One of the virtues of this workshop is, um, for me, has always been that we can talk a little bit nuts and bolts. So I'll uh, talk a little bit about the, the data analysis and some aspects, and then I'll give you a sneak preview of, of the latest results. And now if I can make this computer screen move. Okay, so you've already seen this. I will not elaborate uh, on this cartoon in great length. Um, but I do want to sort of use it 
to establish um, the common wisdom of what we expect uh, photons from various stages of the collisions to look like. So in the initial state where the two nuclei collide, we expect that photons come from hard scattering processes. We expect the power law shaped spectrum. The yield should scale like the number of collisions. Um, and there should not really be any impact of collective motion of the system. Differently, throughout the thermalized phase in the quark muon plasma phase and the Hadron gas phase, we expect thermal radiation and we expect sort of an interplay between temperature driven and blue shift from the expansion of the medium where the temperature driven part is more important early, the blue shift driven part is more important later. The yield we expect to go um, by some power of the number of particles produced that can be as large as two uh, when it's very hot and is probably much smaller uh, than two in, in the later phases. And then eventually the system freezes out and a lot of um, photons will come from Hadron decays. They will be proportional to the number of particles produced and the spectra are derived strictly from the parent momentum spectra. It's uh, to measure photons. One is you can measure them directly in a calorimeter by the energy deposit. You can measure them through electron positron pairs where the electron positron pair can either be from a virtual photon emitted from the collision um, internal conversion, and then you extrapolate to mass equals zero, or from an external conversion where the photon converts in the material of the detector, and then you measure the E plus E minus pair uh, from that conversion. Phoenix, which I will mostly talk about, um, deploys all three methods and Um, of direct photon results from 200 GeV uh, square root of S, PP and gold gold collisions. What is shown here is the invariant yield as a function of PT. The lower data points are PP points from various publications in the past. Um, uh, and it's it's well described by perturbative QCD. Since okay, I can be a pointer. Um, if one scales this up by the number of collision this fit, um, one sees that the gold on gold data is also well described at the high momentum end by by this scaling, but that there is this significant enhancement um, at at low PT, uh, below three four GeV or so. Uh, it has almost an exponential shape. If you do a fit, you get something like 240 uh, MeV. Of course, one needs to be cautious with interpreting that as a temperature, since we, we have to consider also the, the radial expansion of the source. And there is indeed evidence for a radial expansion indirectly through measuring the anisotropy of the radial expansion, um, which is typically measured through these flow coefficients, V2, V3, and so on. So this plot shows for central to um, semi-peripheral collisions, the V2 on the top, V3 on the bottom for direct photons for two different measurements with the calorimeter and with the conversion measurement. And you see there's a sizable V2 that is comparable to that measured for pions uh, in these collisions and one can certainly interpret that as clear evidence that there is you know, an imprint of this blue shift. Now, we've also looked at the system size dependence um, and the system size dependence, because we look at it across beam energies, we look at in terms of charge particle multiplicity. So this is a little bit a busy plot. It's a cross section um, versus the momentum, let's focus first on the middle plot. This is all 
gold on gold at 200 GeV, centrality selected. The scale is such that it is normalized to n the nd charge to the power five fourth, which happens to be how the number of collisions scales uh, with, with the multiplicity. So naturally the high momentum part all overlaps, but also in the low momentum part, they all, all overlap with each other. On the left-hand side is lower beam energy, different at high, um, that thing, it should be different, but very similar at low energies. And then on the right-hand side, is a comparison together with the Alice data uh, with this beautiful measurement. You see the high momentum part again being different, but the low momentum part being very, very similar for these measurements. And to quantify that a little bit more, we've integrated the yield above one GeV um, and then compared that as a function of the charge particle density that is shown in this figure. Uh, so this is the integrated yield on a log scale versus the charge particle multiplicity on a log scale. And you see that all the systems that we have available line up on a common trend, which is around this power dn charge d eta to uh, phi four. Um, the yield is much, if you sort of take the PP integrated yield at 200 GeV and extrapolate it up with the number of collisions for 200 GeV, you see there's about a factor 10 difference in, in the overall yield in this. And if you put all these pieces together, you get the following picture. You certainly see um, a qualitative agreement with what you would expect from thermal sources. There's a large yield at low PP. There's a large anisotropy indicating Doppler shift or blue shift. There's a faster than linear increase with the multiplicity density. However, if you look at it quantitatively and compare to models, um, th there's a clear tension there between the data and the model. So you can get sort of close in the yield um, and in the V2, but you can't get both at the same time. And also the centrality dependence, you expect sort of a steeper centrality dependence from hydrodynamic models than, than the data seems to, to be indicating. Of course, the, the current state, um, and in order to provide more information, we have just recently completed the analysis of the data that was taken in 2014. It takes a long time to analyze these data sets. Um, and what that brings, you can see from this integrated luminosity plot. So these are the historic measurements and the RUN14 data has a factor of 10 more integrated luminosity. It also has the interesting feature that it has a silicon vertex detector, which we exclusively use for this measurement as converter material, 10% conversion and 14%. So we have a healthy photon yield from this measurement. Now, to measure direct photons, you really everything depends on how well you control the systematic uncertainty. So I'll, I'll walk through that uh, quickly. And what I want to mention here, what I'm going to show you are the results of a PhD thesis that was just completed in 2020 uh, and they're being prepared for publication. Um, but the results that I'm going to show are actually from the thesis itself. the systematic uncertainties, we use the following strategy. We don't measure the momentum spectrum directly, but we measure a double ratio, which we call our gamma. And that double ratio is equivalent to the number of photons emitted divided by the number of photons from hadron decays. So if there are no direct photons, this better be one. Um, and then anything above one in the ratio is a direct photon contribution. And then to extract that, we measure the number of photons in the data. In the same sample, we ask how many of those photons at a given PT are reconstructed as pi zeros. Um, in this ratio, basically all efficiencies, conversion lengths, acceptance drops out. 
except for the conditional acceptance that the second photon of the pi zero decay is de detected in the calorimeter. And hmm? and material No, the material drops out to first order. Because the if if it converts here, it has already also converted there. And, and the efficient the conversion probability just drops out. Um, and then that needs to be corrected because we tag pi zeros. Not all photons from are from hadrons are from pi zeros, um, but that is, is is sort of can be determined separately from the parent particle spectra. So just to walk you quickly through, let's look first at this term. Um, this is the measurement of the inclusive photons. This is in one of the most trickiest bins that's at our lower PT end from 800 MeV to one GeV and in the most central uh, centrality class. So that's where the background is the largest. This is sort of the remnant background you have. This is a mass scale, but think of that as the radial position of where the conversion occurs. So that's one ingredient. And then we ask, of these photons, if we combine them with the second photon, how many reconstruct as pi zero? And you see here, this is, as I said, this is the worst case. It's not the typical case, um, but you can clearly extract a, a pi zero signal here. We've made a very detailed Monte Carlo simulation to assure us that our background subtractions work meaning that if there is no signal, we get an R gamma from one uh, and the background subtractions actually work. The condition, so in down here, that was a cartoon of all of them. And then the ones we tagged, these are the one photons um, from pi zeros that um, were, were met, where we missed the second partner, that probability we determined from a Monte Carlo um, calculation I've, I've shown here the result. There's a small centrality dependence. The key ingredients is that there's an energy threshold on the second photon. So you lose whatever is below that energy threshold. The acceptance, of course, and a little bit of the detector material is, is hidden in, in, in this quantity. Okay, and then last but not least, you have to measure the contribution um, of the photons from hadron decays, and then you get the uh, conversion contribution from direct photons. And I'll spend a couple of slides discussing um, this because we have made some um, improvements in there in, in our um, approach. And what I want to, to show you is that this eta to pi zero ratio seems to be actually a very universal function. And that is shown. That is shown. Thank you. A zero ratio as a function of PT for systems from SPS 30 GeV to Alice um, ATEV PP. So this is PP PA, and you see the data all follow. Link what you know we and others have used in the past, and from what Prithya says it should be. Um, so our strategy is the following: we find some empirical parametrization. We use a Gaussian progression approach, so we don't need to assume a shape, and then we determine the eta PT distribution from the pion measurement with this empirical eta to pi zero distribution. Now, they, if you fit this data, they all saturate at an eta two of pi zero of 0.487 plus or minus something. And in order to convince ourselves how universal this is, we have fitted this band, this empirical fit B uh, that gives this value to each data set individually, leaving just the, the normalization constant um, separate. And that's the shown on this next slide. So this here is as a function of square root s, and this is as a function of multiplicity. So here you, you can have also the centrality selected systems. 
here you have minimum bias systems only. And you see that there is absolutely no evidence for any change of this high momentum value of, of eta to pi zero over, you know, these are, are almost three order, two orders of magnitude in multiplicity, um, two, almost three, and four orders of um, in, in multiplicity, three in, in square root of s. Now, of course, in, in heavy ion collisions, the data does not really go to low PT. So the, this doesn't prove the university sality at low PT and you need to be concerned because there's radial flow. And if that's the right picture, the eta should be pushed out more in momentum uh, than, than the pion. So in order to address that, um, we used uh, the approximation that the kaon is roughly the same mass as the eta. And then you look at k to pi in some centrality selection uh, over k to pi in pp and use that as a stand in for um, the eta and correct your eta to pi zero ratio at low pt. This is sort of on the technical side. This is central collisions, peripheral collisions, and this is from Phoenix, and this is um, central collisions from Alice. And then you get sort of an estimate of how different that is from the universal curve you determined from PP. Um, and at RIP energies, it's actually surprisingly not so different. Um, this is a more important effect at, at the LHC, and it's in good agreement with all the various available data. Uh, which is here on the right-hand side. And if you compare that um, at the photon level, the K photon level, then the top plot here is photons from eta over photons from pi zero. The blue band for central collisions is our new estimate compared to the previous estimate. Clear improvement of the systematics. Actually, the effect that we used empty scaling kind of compensated for uh, the flow effect. Uh, which is something we kind of knew back then when we had started this, but in peripheral collisions, we underestimated a little bit. Um, this is a, a summary of the systematic uncertainties of these three effects. The main contribution are really on this conditional efficiency acceptance. Uh, and that's from the energy resolution uh, that determines the threshold of which photons you lose there uh, and the loss due to the second photon converting in the, in the material. Okay, and that all adds up to about 5% increasing somewhat um, with momentum. Okay, and then if you now look at the R gamma ratio uh, for the, this new measurement, that's the purple points and compare that to the previous measurement. So the lower points here are uh, electron positron pair measurements, conversions and virtual photons. The green are direct calorimeter measurements. You see our new measurements for all centralities um, is consistent, um, but it sort of breaches the region between the so far kind of disjunct measurements. Um, you see the same in, uh, if you go now to the spectrum itself. So this is again, the yield versus momentum in four different centralities. The data, again, the four data sets compared to um, the end call scaled um, PT expectation. At high PT, they agree very well. There's a uh, clear overlap here. We have high statistics now also in this transition region. And you see that actually starting around four, maybe even five GeV, there is a significant direct photon contribution also at RIC. Mm -hmm. Is that at the end, because the data looks very similar to what we have measured before, the conclusions with model comparisons are going to be the same, right? So there's no real new insight there, but because we have so much more statistics, we can now 
detail that in more precision. And I will show you two effects there. The first one is I'm going to look at the PT distribution itself. And for that, I will take the data and subtract what we expect uh, from the hard scattering component. Okay, and that is shown here on the right-hand side for one example. So again, this is the cross-section versus PT, but now the hard scattering component is subtracted. And you see that in the, in the low momentum, in the very low momentum part, this is nicely exponential, but it is, is not one exponential over the entire range that we measure. Uh, so what we've done is we fitted two regions one is from 0.8 to 1.9 GeV that yields an effective temperature of 260 MeV. And then from two to four, that yields an effective temperature of 367. Now this is one centrality bin. Um, we've done that for all centrality bins that we have. We can now select finer bins, 10% centrality bins, which we have done. Um, but the shape of the spectra is very much the same for each. And that you can see here where we take different centrality selections and divide by this red line um, and the ratio lines up nicely for, for all centralities. Or in a little bit more detailed look, this is the effective temperature as a function of number of charged particle density. The black points are the data I've just shown you and the red here is the data from the ALICE experiment. The top one is for the lower momentum range. The bottom one is for the higher momentum range. And there is not a clear trend, although given the large statistical and systematic uncertainty, you can't exclude an increase, uh, increasing trend either at this level. And when you compare that to expectations from hydro models at the, in the low PT region, you would expect an increase of the T effective. And indeed, um, this example here shows such an increase um, because most of the emission is sort of near the transition region or after, but the blue shift has a centrality dependence. Um, and that should be shifted more dominant towards more central collisions. Um, would also um, expect an increase. There, the emission is more from the platonic phase, if, if you believe sort of in the common wisdom, there should be a small blue shift, but the initial temperature should be higher the more central your collision is. So again, there should be um, a centrality dependence. Okay, um, a different way to look at the system size or centrality dependence I've already shown you before is to look at the integrated yield um, above some threshold. We choose the same threshold here, one GeV, so that we can compare to our previous work. Um, but there are sort of many more points now from this latest measurement um, for gold, gold at 200 GeV. The, if we fit those data, we get a slope that is 1.1 with some uncertainty, but clearly this is very consistent with what, what we have seen before. If you compare this to theoretical models, this is shown here um, for different lower thresholds in PT, then in the data, you get basically the same slope. If you can read this, it's always 1.1. Uh, um, however, for models, you would expect that the alpha increases as you move to higher PT, and it does from 1.55 to um, roughly 1.7. 1, 1. Um, and then to, to wrap up this story, we extracted the slope in finite PT ranges We have to look hard to see um, any momentum dependence of this. 
And that's actually very interesting because that's not at all what you expect um, in, a, in a hydrodynamic framework mm -hmm. where the low part would be dominated by the hadron gas. Hadron gas from this calculation that I showed earlier, you would expect the slope of 1.23, while for the quark gluon plasma, sorry that the colors are confused here. For the quark gluon plasma, you would expect 1.8, and then at the high PT, you would expect this 1.25 um, empirically. And as you go across PT and this mix of sources varies, you would likely expect sort of some kind of bulgy thing here. But that's not what you see ex experimentally. I'm, I'm well in time. where I had started off, there is still this thermal uh, photon puzzle that qualitatively, it kind of is, looks like our standard picture of a thermal source, but it's quantitatively challenging. So if you look in detail, which we now can with the experiment, experimental precision we have, it doesn't quite fit. Okay, now that could be because in the common picture, there are some sources uh, that might not yet be fully addressed. Um, one is photons from the very strong magnetic fields in the very beginning. You would expect a significant contribution in the intermediate PT range, large V2, no V3. We're not sure what the centrality dependence would be. You have jet medium interactions, again, that would populate the intermediate PT range, small V2, little bit of due to the jet interactions with the medium should probably scale like the number of collisions. There could be something from the pre-equilibrium phase, um, again, in the intermediate PT range, um, or there could be light from the hadronization itself that typically isn't considered. Uh, specifically, um, that would be at low PT. It would be, it would have sort of a blue shift, um, and it would probably have a centrality dependence similar to to the hadron gas. So, from the experimental side, what we still have um, up our sleeves, there's still a number of data sets that haven't been analyzed uh, from Phoenix, and that we are analyzing. That kind of summarize that here. Um, there are high statistics from copper gold, which we're looking into, um, and gold gold. We haven't fully analyzed the V2 and V3 from these high uh, energy um, data sets, and you can have sort of different collision geometry at the same number of charged particles. And we'll, we'll see sort of what that additional information will contribute. We have some preliminary data that has been shown previously from uh, the RAN 14 that shows sort of a strong V2 like we have seen before and sort of very little at, at high momentum. We also have small systems. We've shown preliminary data before. We're in the process of finalizing those that will populate together with the copper gold, this lower um, range. And then um, at the very end, you know, this, is the most difficult measurement in, in my mind that you can do in heavy ions, uh, lepton pair measurements. Uh, I won't sort of advertise the virtues of that, but you know we're dreaming of measuring this region here in between. Um, why we're doing that is because we have uh, the required statistics. We have about 34 billion events recorded between run 14 and run 16. And those events are recorded with a vertex detector, um, vertex tracker that allows to identify um, electrons from heavy flavor decays. So at least in principle, there is a hope that we can disentangle this. Of course, we also put in 14% of a radiation length um, in with the vertex detector with which floods us with photon conversion. So whether or not this is really feasible still yet needs to be shown. And that's where I'll leave you with. Thank you.
thank you very much for this interesting talk. It's nice to see that show is going on. And uh, I found this ether measurement extremely striking. I mean, <laughs> since we had discussed this already, I mean, this is a, quite an effect, right? I mean, that, that basically common wisdom so far was completely failing. I mean, you showed that you're fit. Maybe it's the same information. Yeah. Yeah, this one there. Yeah. I mean, that's very impressive, right? I mean, there's a, a huge loss. I mean, now if I listen to Jochen, I would say that he found Carl Simley restoration because the, the N star 1535 is shifted down in mass and then it's below the EDA threshold. So you don't get EDA out anymore. So one possible explanation for the, of course, very speculative, but something must be going on there. I mean, this is so crazy with this ETA. Also in the thermal model, it does not really always work well, right? Right. Now, well, well so... Why, why that is, right? If you look at... I know the topic. You can decide uh, which ones you want to address. So the first one is, um, of course, it, it, the question is uh, uh, how, how this compares to star data, if that has been resolved. Um, um, wanna, okay. I, I mean, there, there's no new information from STAR. So in, it's still you know, a discrepancy in, in qu quite in a, a bit, while. actually. Um, the STAR data have a similar slope if you plot them like this, but they're, they're below. Um, but we're, we're quite confident. I mean, I mean, we've done this measurement many times over different groups, different methods. You know, what, what, what else can I say? We're, we're quite confident that is correct. Yeah, okay. So, so the second question is about, so, so it's very much appreciated uh, what you did for the ETA and uh, it was, uh, you know, a surprise, but there could be another surprise that we actually pointed out 10 years ago in the 2011 paper with uh, Hendrik and uh, Charles Gale, and that's uh, the Omega. Hmm. And that can have a large yield and it has a very large decay branching into photons. So if there's something going on with you and, and it's much more susceptible to flow, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a source which essentially scales with N charge, maybe a little, little, little more because it's a little heavier, but uh, you know, not far from N charge. So, so that is really something I think that should also be uh, looked into. And uh, the third question, uh, third issue is about this, uh, the, the sources you had on uh, the last slide. I think uh, one, two, and three are ruled out more or less. Which, because they, they, which they, ones? Uh, one, two, and three. Uh, so, <laughs> magnetic field, you, you never get in long enough a field to, to get any yield into your system. Um, the jet medium has, has, the, has uh, the wrong V2, it actually has a uh, negative V2. Um, the the pre equilibrium also, you know, it, it's a very small V2 and, and, and probably much stronger uh, centrality pens, as you say there. So really the only thing left is that, uh, and, and with that I sympathize, uh, the light from the hadronization, this we also discussed uh, a couple of years later because we were prompted by this puzzle. So we looked into a factor three enhancement from uh, right around uh, hadronization. Uh, I, you know, I, I don't think hadronization is a special process, right? We, we're talking about a crossover transition and what we usually discuss is rates from the different phases and then we match them and uh, yeah, there could be, but it's a by and large, you know, we had zero chemical potential. It's a continuous transition. So it would be somewhat surprising if there's all a sudden factor three enhancement. Uh, we, we still follow through with it. It helps somewhat. So, so but that may be the last man standing actually, uh, plus, plus the omega. And that's, uh, that's all I uh, want to say. Okay, so, so let me address the, the other two things you mentioned. Um, un unless something happens to the omega, which, which of course it could, um, the omega contributes significantly less photons than the eta. So if you control the eta, you have the main thing. And you know what we are, we're planning to do as next line of defense, because there, there isn't that much data for the omega, 
is to continue to use MT scaling, but tie it to the eta rather than to the pi zero. Um, that's the, the best thing that, that I can come up with to do. Um, concerning this picture, um, if I'll formulate what you said a little bit more aggressively, this is maybe gra this is grasping for straws, right? Um, may maybe, um, but it does leave us with, with this issue that you know the standard picture we're following doesn't quite quantitatively describe the features of the data. So there are two ways out of this. There's something wrong with the data or there's something wrong with the standard picture. And you know, this, this is sort of grasping for straws to throw in some extra ingredients, but maybe there's something really wrong, um, which I think would, would have profound consequences also for all the thinking about dialect ones. Absolutely. It has to show up in the low master leptons around 0.2. If there's, if you talk, talking in factor two, uh, you know, that, that is a major uh, contribution to uh, dileptons uh, in, in the pi zero dalits and probably further out. About the eta uh, universal ratio. So you showed that then in that, that when you put the correction for the flow, you have, uh, uh, you, you go back almost to the, empty scaling and you don't have a large dis difference. However, in PP, this compensation should not happen. So I was wondering how this impacts then on your uh, PP spectrum that you use uh, to interpret the, the, the data, because I guess that in PP, you, you don't have this, this flow or not necessarily. And right. then you have a larger difference between uh, the empty scaling approach and uh, the new one. Right. Um... So the fact that for more central collisions, there's not that big of an effect um, comes about because we put in a pi zero spectrum that already had the flow implemented, right, by nature. Um, so that, that, that doesn't, that sort of compensates for, for this deviation. Uh, for the Case where the photon spectrum is important, let me go back to here, is sort of above three GeV, right? Below the, the systematic uncertainties are very large to begin with. Um, and above three GeV, this deviation from empty scaling is, is not really an issue. Let's uh, thank Axel for the very interesting contribution. At this point, uh, we go to the next talk by Shihiro Sasaki. So let's uh, get started. Um, first of all, thank you very much, the organizers, for invitation to this workshop. And uh, it's really a pity that uh, I couldn't go there um, because of some technical uh, difficulties for me. But uh, in any case, I'm very happy to be uh, there with you remotely. Okay, this talk is exclusively talk about, uh, about uh, uh, the chiral mixing in the medium and then uh, why chiral mixing. This has been already discussed a couple of times today. Uh, this is because this is the ideal way to disentangle uh, uh, the, uh, the signatures uh, associated with chiral symmetry breaking from uh, another signature uh, directly related to the chiral symmetry restoration. Um, so this is clearly the best way uh, to see not only the vector meson property change, but also the similar modifications of axial vector mesons because they are, their differences uh, are the, uh, the chiral, uh, the order parameter. Good, um, so uh, just one, uh, the sentence definition of the chiral mixing. So the point is that the axial vector mesons can show up, it appears in the vector spe spectral function in the presence of hotter dense medium. This phenomena is known as chiral mix. Okay, so this is actually my one page, uh, the summary without any uh, mathematical expressions. Um, so we have uh, well-known uh, the baseline, uh, the spectral function in the vector channel, um, far from uh, the chiral symmetry restoration, zero temperature and zero chemical potential essentially. 
And then we have the, uh, the Romeson peak. And then this little shoulder is coming from uh, the axial vector meson through the chiral mixing. This was already uh, discussed in the first talk today. This is known as uh, the, the low energy theorem by Day, Elitsky, and Yoffe. Okay, um, so if your system is hot enough and dilute enough, and then uh, we know the, the fate of the shape of a spectral function. So this will be represented in the red curve. So namely, this chiral mixing between rho and A1 must be resolved when the chiral symmetry gets restored. And uh, this effect, uh, as I said, has been very well known and then recognized, so therefore implemented in, 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 in the many uh, calculations done so far. On the other hand, uh, there exists another class of chiral mixing. This is totally new. And then this is exactly what I'm going to talk about. So you see, um, so I will show you this is generated uh, directly by the density through the charm simon charm in five dimensional theory, or uh, if you prefer four dimensional theory, this is induced through the West Mino Witten action. And uh, if your system is cold enough and dense enough, and then you see the, uh, such a drastic uh, modification in the structure of vector spectral function at the chiral symmetry restoration. And then I'm going to show you that uh, this is uh, further enhanced if. Uh, yeah, so this, uh, this modification is uh, becomes maximal when the chiral symmetry gets restored. And then if you have no chiral symmetry at all in your system, and then you do not see such a uh, drastic modification. Okay, our study was uh, motivated uh, by this holographic uh, study done some years ago. Uh, they started with a five dimensional holographic action with uh, the extra U1 symmetry associated with, associated with the, the baryon chemical potential. And then they have deduced the four dimensional effective action like this. And then the first line, very standard, second line, again standard, except the last term. So the, that, the last term in red is, uh, it emerges directly from uh, the Chan Simon term. And then here C is at the moment unknown parameter but uh, you see uh, from the form of the operators, this is responsible for the mixing between raw meson and an axial vector meson. And then here, I, J, K, those, uh, they runs from one to three without time component. Consequently, uh, the longitudinal polarization of your vector states and axial vector states, they are unmodified by the last term. But only the transverse polarizations are modified according to uh, this uh, dispersion relation shown here. So the plus sign is for the axial vector dispersion relation, and then minus sign is for the Romeson dispersion relation uh, with a certain uh, strength of the, uh, the uh, mixing parameter C. So just for the illustrative purpose, for the time being, let's take uh, two different values. Uh, the transfer, uh, the, uh, this, this parameter C being 0.5 GV in blue, and uh, another choice is uh, uh, the 1GB for the parameter C. And then, I mean, it's uh, extremely easy to make a plot corresponding to the plot for the vector states and axial vector states with a given value of the parameter C as a function of P0 and the P vector. So what's the consequence? The consequence is, as, a, as I have announced, the drastic modification of the spectral function. This is not anymore the standard bright wigner shape. The reason is the following. Uh, so according to uh, the mixing, the transverse uh, axial vector states is their mass is shifted upward. On the other hand, the transverse uh, the polarization of vector meson is shifted downward with a given uh, the parameter, let's say C being uh, the one GV to be kept and three momentum like uh, the 0.5 GED. And then uh, the consequence is that the transverse uh, the component of the vector spectral function uh, this has such a two maximum. So one maximum is associated with the shifted, uh, the transverse raw meson. And then another one, this uh, left and right hand side is uh, associated with the transverse shifted axial vector meson. And uh, the longitudinal one is unmodified. And then the final form for the spectral function is the spin average one in red. Okay, so therefore typically uh, our vector spectral function has three uh, broad maximum. So like this, it's really bumpy. Good, of course, the uh, all overall relevance 
of such a the, uh, the mixing, chiral mixing effect is crucially depending on the choice of the parameter C. So why I have chosen such a huge number? So I'm going to tell you. Um, so by the way, uh, we don't need to rely on the holography at all to determine the value of the mixing parameter C. So instead of, hol instead of holographic uh, the languages, uh, we can, um, as a standard uh, uh, the methodology, we started with the four-dimensional effective theory with the best mean of return action. And then when you look at carefully the terms which involve omega, rho, and the A1, and then it takes such a form. Okay, and then the next step of sort of uh, the approximation is that the typically in the dealing with the nuclear matter and then its thermodynamics, we replace this omega mu operator with the vacuum expectation value of zeroth component of omega. And then uh, this can be easily evaluated when you take like uh, uh, the, uh, the Valetska model. And then it's essentially uh, the density. It's directly proportional to uh, the barium density and we here. And when you plug uh, back into this formula and then compare with uh, this holographic motivated expression, and then you can uh, immediately extract the, the formula uh, for the mixing parameter C. So this is given like this. So this parameter is empirically known, this is known, this is known, and omega, of course. So the point is that the, the C, the mixing parameter is directly related to the directly proportional to density. So therefore this mixing effect does exist at any density. So this is a big uh, difference from the conventional chiral mixing uh, uh, characterized by the day elitsky yofe theorem. Okay, so what about the mixing strength? When you put empirical numbers into those places and then you will get just 100 MeV at the saturation density. Rho zero, rho zero or M zero, sorry for different notations. And then the, so previously I have chosen one GB, 10 order of magnitude different, higher. Why? Because this is the, uh, the prediction from the ADS, uh, the CFT approach at the same saturation density. So there is a huge difference between them. And then uh, it's, uh, it's problematic because uh, if you take such a extremely strong the mixing between the vector and actual vector states, and then your ground state uh, is suffer from some instability. Um, so this is evident from this uh, the weird behavior in red for the raw meson uh, dispersion relation. This leads to actual actually the vector meson condensation. But of course, this is precisely what we avoid because this is not like I mean our uh, empirically known nuclear ground state is not like that with the vector mass and condensation. So apparently such a huge, the number for the parameter C is large NC article. So most likely uh, such a the large contributions are coming from higher line states of omega in large NC context. And then we actually know such a very similar situation uh, in the description of vector meson dominance in Sakai CD model model, this is one of the top down approach of uh, QCD. So therefore, uh, so far the message is that uh, the ADS CFT prediction for the parameter C is just unrealistic. So therefore we don't like to take this. So instead we better stick to this uh, one, uh, 0.1 GB value at the saturation density because the derivation is very standard. On the other hand, you may be worried about there is no uh, consequence at all because when you come back to the dispersion relation, I mean, this is the blue line is already given for the slightly, I mean, the much higher value for the parameter C. So blue was given for 0.5 GB. However, the point is that this parameter C is proportional to linearly the, the barium density. And then the density is gradually increase, and then at some point, we should see uh, the onset of partial chiral symmetry restoration. Okay, so this is so far the missing piece. So therefore, uh, we need to take care of it. So the very best way to see the effect of chiral symmetry restoration in this context is again the dispersion relations, which are now Taylor expanded for small three momentum P bar. Again, plus sign is for A1, minus uh, the sign is for the raw meson dispersion relation. And then the point is that uh, the, this term, the C is just a mixing parameter, but this is inversely proportional to the mass difference between the party partner. 
So therefore, when the chiral symmetry gets restored, uh, the, uh, the mixing effect uh, would be effectively enhanced. Okay, so therefore, at the moment, we have such a good hope that uh, the uh, drastic change in the spectral function could still be surviving near the chiral symmetry restoration in the spectral function. Okay, let's make a check. So for this, we need to carefully examine the immediate mass difference between par uh, party partners and the, the uh, immediate mixing parameter C. And then as we have seen, this is provided by the evaluation of the omega zero condensation. And uh, uh, there are many ways to evaluate those two quantities. For instance, you can continue with the Valeska type model, but here we have taken the uh, sort of uh, the hybrid approach uh, containing not only nucleons and meson, but also quarks. The model has been developed in uh, Brotsdorf in our group. The main driving person was uh, the Mihal Marchenko. And then this model was confronted to the property of uh, the neutron star matters. And then the several important model parameters uh, were fixed reliably uh, through the astrophysical uh, observable, like the, the uh, mass radius relation and compactness and tidal deformability and so on. Okay. All right. So this is sufficiently good for our illustrative computation. All right. So the mass differences, uh, delta M can be easily uh, computed in the given uh, extension, nice extension of the Valetska model in the under the mean field approximation at finite temperature. So just for illustration, I have taken 50 MeV for the temperature. And this is the delta, delta M, the mass difference normalized by the same quantity in matter-free space. This is essentially proportional to uh, the chiral order parameter, pi on decay constant. And uh, when you take uh, its derivative with respect to chemical potential, and then you see two times of inflection point, and then the first inflection point, this is uh, the remnant of nuclear liquid gas phase transition. And uh, the second inflection point, this is actually stronger, is associated with uh, the chiral crossover. And then corresponding uh, the net barium density in this case is about 2.5 times uh, the, uh, the rho zero, the saturation density. And similarly, one can also deduce uh, the coupling, uh, the, the mixing parameter C, multiply by the, uh, the constant factor five, because this is not uh, the large number, is shown in the blue cup here in the unit of GED. Okay, so to proceed, um, so this is, uh, okay, so I need to show a couple of uh, equations for this purpose. Um, so this, uh, so they are the very general uh, the expressions for the longitudinal component and transverse component for the uh, vector vector current correlation function in the presence of uh, the uh, chiral mixing parameter C. Okay. And then, as I said, the, the longitudinal component is unchanged. So, therefore, this is completely free from the parameter C. And the, only the transverse component has such a, a little bit complicated form thanks to the mixing for finite uh, the three momentum. Uh, and then they are parameterized in terms of the standard, uh, the propagator inverse for the raw meson and axial vector mesons. Okay, so far the expressions are sufficiently general. And then in principle, uh, the masses and then with that appears in those two formula must be evaluated in the, media, uh, in the presence of medium. Okay, so therefore they are fully uh, sort of dressed quantities in principle, but of course, I mean, uh, Practically, it's uh, rather hard to implement everything at once. So therefore, just to see, uh, first of all, the effect of inclusion of such a par new parameter C, the mixing effect, uh, in the simplest possible setup, let's make rather drastic approximation. Uh, so namely, let's assume that uh, we modify only the masses and the width of the vector meson states. So namely, the mass of the vector meson, the mass of width, they are just unchanged. They're completely same as the value in matter free space. I admit that this is a really drastic, uh, rather unrealistic uh, assumption. But as I said, as a first step to see the effect, this is just sufficient. And then uh, I will come back to this point and then how uh, possibly uh, this assumption would be uh, uh, lifted away later. Um, okay, and then uh, the next step is to set 
the axial vector spectral function and the vector spectral function, they are said to be equal at the chiral symmetry respiration at the chiral crossover in, in the current setup. And then this is, of course, the general setup, the general requirement of the chiral, unbroken chiral symmetry. Uh, but according to my first assumption, the uh, axial vector spectral function will contain the finite, the, the decay width at the chiral symmetry restriction, but this value should be exactly the same as the vector spectral function in matter free space. Okay. All right. So let's make a look at the uh, the, the raw meson spectral function, just forget about omega and phi meson, but at the same at the temperature as before. And then here I have chosen three different chemical potential, very low chemical potential, namely very far from chiral restoration and the intermediate chemical potential and at the chiral crossover. And then you see uh, the gradually uh, the, uh, the, the modification uh, due to the mixing effect comes into the spectral function, and then it becomes really um, uh, dramatic when the chiral symmetry gets restored. And then it's also quite uh, constructive to repeat the same computation, but in different scenario without chiral symmetry restoration. The results are down here. So essentially, you see no effect. And then at the highest possible chemical potential corresponding to this plot, you see some little change, but essentially it's negligible. This is because um, if the uh, chiral symmetry is not restored at all, the effectively the effect of the chiral mixing is just negligibly small. And then uh, what we have shown here is uh, nicely justifying the uh, what I mentioned as my uh, speculation here, based on the dispersion relation argument. Okay, very good. So therefore, here I conclude that such a drastic modification of the spe vector spectral function is the consequence of the chiral symmetry restoration at high density, uh, the baryonic matter. So this is the same spectral function, but now I have put uh, the uh, omega meson as well. And then uh, since they appeared very close to each other, the, uh, the typical bumpy structure, this we have seen, uh, in different uh, the chemical potential, but uh, I mean, essentially the structure is similar as before. And then uh, the difference is really evident compared to this blue curve. Blue curve is our baseline, okay? Uh, what about a five meson sector? And then the typical, uh, the three peak structure is best preserved in this uh, the sector of five mesons. And then uh, you see clearly the, uh, the appearance, the emergence of the actual vector counterpart of the phi meson, according to the, the list of PDG, this is called F1 state. Five minutes, okay, thank you. Okay, and then, okay, this is uh, the F1, transverse polarization of F1 state comes in through the spectral function. And then this is uh, the second one, middle one is longitudinal uh, the state of phi meson. And then very left one is the long transverse polarization of phi meson. Good, so this is the resultant dielectron rates uh, integrated over three momentum at the, uh, the finite temperature evaluated at the chiral crossover chemical potential. And then we see some characteristic behavior even after integrating over three momentum. Uh, so now my mouse doesn't work here and then there. Okay, in particular around the 1 GB. Okay, so as I have announced, uh, my uh, uh, calculation so far was uh, uh, too idealistic, so therefore it's time uh, to somehow uh, make it more uh, reliable uh, by introducing baryonic resonances in the raw nucleon channel. So this has been well known and it has been already mentioned today a couple of times. So especially those two, uh, the baryonic resonances, uh, they strongly couple to raw meson in nuclear matter. So therefore it's very well known that it deforms quite a bit the vector meson spectral function like this. And then because of strong uh, level, level repulsion uh, at finite density, we do not see anymore uh, the remnant of raw meson peak in the spectral function, which is uh, listed here in the, uh, shown in the dotted line here. Okay, and then afterwards, the calculation was further improved by Ralph Rapp and his, his collaborators uh, by introducing more baryonic resonances uh, and then the parameters were fixed uh, by confronting the data of uh, the photoabsorption cross-section 
Uh, also, the, uh, the imidium, the decay width for those variant resonances are uh, assumed like this in the, such a linear form uh, with, with respect to the density. And then its coefficient, this parameter, the medium, uh, the modification in the width, they are uh, in the same way extracted from the photoabsorption cross-section data. Okay, and then those, all those states together with the, the new parameters, they can be nicely compiled into the computation and then in, in the standard fashion of the computation and then this is the result. So in a sense, as we have expected, the signals have been diminished to a large extent uh, by the not only P wave, but also S wave, uh, the variant states, which we have included. Okay, let me explain. Um, so here I have tried three different cases. So different, so this is a case study. So let me start with the green one. So this is in a sense uh, the, uh, uh, um, the baseline. So namely the, uh, the computation uh, with the, uh, um, so this, uh, those baryonic P wave state dressed uh, for the Ramazan in medium spectral function, but the scenario without chiral symmetry restoration. Not at all. So therefore, no degeneracy between party partners at all. And then this was compared with other two uh, different scenarios. And then, but both, okay, so let me take this blue one. So this is the scenario with chiral symmetry restoration here. Um, so I have, I have put, I have modified the masses of negative party baryonic states according to the requirement from chiral symmetry restoration. And then unfortunately, I mean, they are, I mean, when you compare those blue one and green one, they are very similar, um, but uh, there is no order of magnitude difference. On the other hand, the, uh, the very last one in red, this is also the, the, uh, the result with chiral symmetry restoration, but it was motivated by very recent, uh, the paper, uh, the preprint posted a couple of weeks ago by Su Hon Lee and his collaborator. So they have taken uh, the QCB summer rule approach and then computed a set of party, uh, the, the, the lowest line, uh, the baryons and lower line, uh, the mesons, including rho and A1 meson, and then computed uh, the, those masses in uh, the phase uh, with unbroken chiral symmetry. And then they have observed that the, the rho meson mass in this phase is like, uh, I mean, 500 to 600 MeV. So there is an obvious mass difference between the conventional value in chiral symmetry broken phase. So here uh, we have chosen uh, the, the average one, 550 MeV for uh, the mass of the raw mesome. Uh, and then, uh, so that way we have obtained the red curve. So in this case, the difference between the scenario of this green one without chiral symmetry is rather big at least one order of magnitude difference. So this is nice, but still uh, the which scenario will be chosen at the moment is unclear. So, I mean, but in any case, such a case study is quite interesting to get some insight. So what about the five meson? So the five meson is very different from the raw meson because according to the many previous computation done so far, the five meson remains well-defined the resonance, but still it's nice uh, as a case study to, uh, to see the effect where the, the vacuum decay width of the five mesons uh, is uh, the multiplied by some constant factor like three or factor five, and then those numbers I can find in the literature. And as expected, again, it's broadened, right? But still we see the uh, additional contribution around one GB here, and also systematic upward contribution um, everywhere here around about one GB. And then this effect, uh, cannot be produced in the absence of chiral mix. And uh, so this is a kind of supplemental uh, the plot. So uh, in the current, uh, the toy model of the extension of Valetska model, uh, we obtained at the, the temperature of 50 MeV, the crossover and then crossover appears 2.5 times rho zero, but still it's uh, theoretically, it's an option uh, that uh, the, uh, the chiral restoration could appear at a higher chemical, higher density. And then in this case, in the given range, the, uh, the signal would somehow develop like this as a function of the density. So it's still there, assuming that uh, the five meson uh, decay width is like four or five times uh, the vacuum bound. So it's already broadened enough. Okay, so this is the summary. Um, 
So I have shown that there is a new type, completely new type of chiral mixing. This is induced entirely by the density through the West mineral return action. And then this exists everywhere. And uh, because of this mixing, the, uh, the, the vector spectral function is drastically modified. And then possibly uh, this could be measured in upcoming uh, the heavy ion experiment as the signature of chiral symmetry restoration. And then there are basically two important things to be done. The first thing is uh, the, uh, we need to uh, more reliably estimate the mixing strength C. Uh, and then like uh, in this context, we can uh, use the large data set of the vector spectral function at the finite chemical potential done in the context of two, two color lattice QCD. So this idea came out during the conversation with uh, Maria Rombaldo a few years ago, and then we will work it out for sure. And uh, in principle, the functional, uh, the renormalization approach does have the capability to handle not only the mixing parameter, but also some other uh, exotic operators, which appear only in the presence of uh, the, the finite chemical potential. And then another point is, uh, again, the more uh, refined uh, approach or self-consistent approach, especially near chiral symmetry restoration, the, uh, the effect of many body effects to get more insight into the width and also the actual lifetime of fine meson during uh, the fireable evolution. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Kihiro. Um, so we have time for questions. Um, yeah, I have to look. Uh, Leon Juan, please. Hi, uh, I have a question on your uh, spectral function. You, you can switch on your camera, then we see you. Sure. <laughs> yes, I have a question on your um, uh, raw spectral function calculation. You compare, because I can't see the slide number, you, you compare the case without current symmetry uh, restoration, mm -hmm. yes. and then you have, and then you have a, a yeah, uh, just keep going down, and you have the case with chiral symmetry restoration scenario one and the scenario yes, two. Yes. yes, this part. Mm -hmm. So, um, if I have a experimental data which actually match, for example, uh, the red curve, or significantly higher than the case without chiral symmetry restoration, can we say this is the evidence of our chiral symmetry rest restoration? I mean, theoretic uncertainty, you do have all those theoretic uncertainty, but mm -hmm. if just assuming experimental data is really significantly above the, the case without color symmetry restoration, can we say this is yeah, not the, the moment, evidence? And then there is a possibility to interpret it. You are such a, I mean, uh, the, the extremely large contribution uh, could be associated with the color symmetry restoration, at least indicated this plot. However, to, I mean, the, to, to really, uh, the make a conclusion in this context. I mean, of course, I mean, this, uh, this my spectral function should be uh, further extended by implementing many other uh, stuff to make everything more realistic and then should be uh, computed under the, I mean, the, the acceptance of each machine. And then this is exactly the idea we just started with uh, Tatiana, with the uh, hardest people. If uh, we still see some, uh, I mean, the remnant of the signal in the realistic case. Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. By uh, Joachim. Yeah, thanks, Chihiro, for this nice talk. I, I was wondering what of these effects or how much of the effects would still be visible in cold, really cold ground state nuclear matter density, because then. That would be a strong motivation for the J-Park experiment because I think they are very sensitive then to that with the high statistics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so this is, uh, I mean, my plan, right? I mean, uh, so at the moment, I, I have included part of the many body effects expected uh, in, in the conventional fashion. Conventional means just perturbative, but also a couple, under a couple of uh, uh, approximations. And uh, I mean, I, I believe in principle, there must be a way out to do the same computation to fully implement the many body effects and then also perfectly self-consistent to the chiral symmetry, not only the chiral symmetry, uh, the restoration, but also the, the, the reliable description for the physics in chiral broken place. But it's, uh, yeah, it's technically difficult. I mean, at, at the moment, I do not see, uh, I mean, <laughs> the uh, economic way how to handle this. 
I, I can't, uh, I, I mean, I can't get the result in a few days, but maybe in, uh, in, in a couple of months <laughs> after some, some, some uh, I don't know, uh, some more insights from other colleagues in the, in the workshop. This is basically the idea why I am here. From Tetiana. Yes, Shihiro, thanks for the talk. If you would please go to the spectra where you show phi. Mm -hmm. So the, the NDM by zoom, zoom up. Yeah, maybe this one or either way. So is it understood the nature of the peak which is developed at 1.1 GeV? That's the one question. And the second one, is it also clear from where this kind of threshold effect comes about at 0.98? Ah, okay. And, Okay, this threshold, this is uh, coming from my very simplified computation. So I did not assume anything about the, the five meson decay width. So therefore, just like in the vacuum case, five meson decay into two kaons. So that's why this threshold appears. But of course, in a, in a more realistic computation, in, in, especially in the, in the presence of nuclear matter, this uh, the sharp threshold effect should be gone. And uh, another question, this is uh, the position of this additional peak here. Uh, this is not uh, the universal, uh, the result. So the, what's universal is that if uh, we have the mixing effect with a certain strength and then su such additional peaks should appear. However, this position uh, depends on the value of the mixing parameter C. So at the moment, I, I have taken the value for this mixing parameter C extracted from um, the type of extended version of Valetska model. So this is essentially Valetska model in the mean field computation. So therefore it's uh, likely that uh, my mean field, mean field computation uh, is missing some essential physics, uh, particularly uh, important one near the chiral symmetry restoration. In this context, the, uh, the location of the additional peak, this one is not really, com uh, I mean, uh, conclusive. But however, somewhere in between. This is uh, the best, everything that I can yeah. tell you at the moment. Okay, thank you, Chihiro. And um, to the last talk of this uh, session by Sudhir Padurang Rode from Joint Institute. Could you please uh, share your screen? Let me start. So first of all, um, thanks a lot. Uh, to the organizers for allowing me to present uh, work on prospects for direct on direct on measurements with MPD at uh, Nika. So uh, the outline of my presentation is uh, that uh, firstly I will talk a bit about the motivation uh, of the Nika uh, and uh, MPD experiment, and uh, as well as the dielectrons in general. And then I will introduce. Uh, MPD apparatus and subsyst subsystems therein. Then I will talk a bit about the prospects for dielectrons at MPD and the challenges therein, in particular, uh, the rejection of the combinatorial from conversion as well as dielectrons from phi zero dielectrons. And then I will conclude. So, um, Nika, Nika acceleration, accelerator complex at, uh, at JNR is, is in construction and um, it consists of uh, a uh, um, various uh, uh, experiment such as MPD uh, SPD and uh, fixed target experiment as such as uh, BM at N. So there is a booster, uh, then there is a nucleotron which is uh, connected to the Nika collider, and uh, then there are two uh, interaction points MPD and uh, SPD. So I will focus on MPD. Uh, for the Nika, the design uh, center of mass energy is uh, between 4 to 11 GeV, and the uh, design luminosity is uh, around 10 to the power 27 per centimeter square uh, per second. The the goal of Nika facility is to uh, uh, to explore the high high uh, baryon chemical potential matter, which is uh, uh, which is at uh, which is, could be produced at low energy uh, heavy and collision. Uh, and, and common goal uh, is, is to search for possible first order phase transition as well as the uh, critical endpoint if there is any. Uh, among various uh, physics motivations and physics goals of MPD experiment, 
um, it has a very rich and exciting uh, dielectron program uh, mapped out. And uh, speaking of uh, dielectrons, um, various uh, invariant mass regions uh, in, in dielectron, uh, dielectron invariant mass spectra uh, can reveal uh, various physics messages. For instance, uh, in intermediate mass regions, uh, if you have a excitation function of uh, inverse, uh, inverse slope parameter shown in uh, here red uh, points uh, within a uh, bit integrated over the invariant mass range of uh, 1.5 to 2.5, uh, it is seemed to be uh, closely related to the initial temperature of the fireball Ti, and uh, such a measurement can uh, act as a thermometer for uh, heavy ion collisions. If you look at the low mass regions, uh, previously at SPS and uh, RIC, uh, it has been seen that the excess in dielectron yields um, could um, associate with the broadening of the rho meson spectral function, which further link uh, could link to the restoration of the chiral symmetry. And if you have an integrated uh, uh, invariant mass yield between 0.3 to 0.7, and uh, total contribution from both QZP and the hydronic uh, uh, seem to be proportional to the lifetime of the fireball. And such measurements can uh, help in tracking the um, uh, lifetime of the fireball and, and can also work as a chronometer for heavy ion collision. So speaking of uh, the experiment, uh, um, uh, MPD experiment. Uh, this is a full configuration, uh, which has almost uh, four pi configuration. It includes uh, it it it, it uh, includes uh, different subdetectors like TPC, TOF, ECAL, uh, FHCAL, uh, that is for uh, forward hydron calorimeter, uh, fast forward detector, ITS, and NCAP. Um, it is foreseen that the MPD uh, experiment will be installed in two stages. Um, in stage one, we will have a service of uh, TPC, uh, TOF, ECAL, power hydron calorimeter, and uh, uh, FFD, that is fast forward detector. Um, in stage two, we will have additional service of ITS and NCAP. Um, as far as the current uh, plan concerns, uh, stage one, uh, so MPD experiment uh, with stage one will be ready for commissioning with beam sometime in 2023 and uh, among uh, as far as beam concern for the for the detector for the first year of the operation uh, bismuth bismuth at uh, center of energy uh, center of mass energy 9.2 gev is expected and uh, for the later for the next year uh, we will go back to the gold gold uh, uh, beams uh, between 4 to 11 gev uh, center of mass energy so uh, there are many uh, subdetectors. So I will speak a bit about them. Uh, so firstly, time projection chamber. Um, it's a it is a main detector in MPD. Uh, on on the right, I show you the dimensions and the ingredients of the detector. Uh, as far as the readout chamber is concerned, the technology which is used is MWPC. There are twelve uh, readout chambers on each end cap and uh, 53 pad rows per, per uh, ROC. Uh, for the gas volume, uh, the gas mixture is uh, argon plus methane with the percentage of 90% uh, and 10% respectively. The maximum design rate for TPC to handle is, uh, is about seven kilohertz. And uh, as far as the construction of the TPC concern, uh, the TPC vessels and uh, and then the readout chambers are are produced and uh, electronics, corresponding electronics uh, is in mass production. Uh, as far as uh, the, the function of TPC concern, uh, it will provide 3D tracking and uh, D by DX measurement. Uh, uh, the performance of the TPC is such that it can provide the tracking, track if reconstruction efficiency for uh, primary tracks up to 100% beyond 200 MeV and for secondary particles, uh, it will provide around 100% above 600 MeV. Um, energy energy, specific energy loss resolution of TPC is expect, expected to be about around 6 to 
and uh, TPC has ability to discriminate charge pions from kaons up to moment of 0.7 and uh, uh, kaons and uh, kaons from proton up to 1.1 uh, GV uh, in linear moment. The next detector is uh, TOF, time of flight. The technology on which it is based is MRPC. The function of TPC is to measure the time of flight uh, for the identification of the particles. Um, around 40% of the MRPCs are uh, ready and the mass production is ongoing. Uh, the design time resolution for TOF is around 80 picoseconds. Um, also the TOF matching um, efficiency of uh, TOF uh, which is overall is around 90 percent and uh, it drops uh, below 80 percent um, uh, for the momentum less than 250 mev then if you want to have a better uh, pid performance of TOF, it is better to combine with uh, tpc and uh, tpc plus TOF provides a very good uh, uh, pid performance as well as uh, tracking the next detector is uh, ECAL, electromagnetic calorimeter. This is really important uh, for the analysis of dielectrons. Um, this, uh, this, it is a Schalzig type of uh, calorimeter made of, of, made of uh, uh, lead scintillator sandwiches. Um, for the, uh, in the full configuration, there are 50 half sectors, uh, that is 25 full sectors uh, with, with azimuthal range of 14.4 degree. The function of ECAL is to measure uh, deposited energy of the track, and uh, with this, we can uh, ECAL can detect particles of energy from uh, 10 AV to few GeV. Uh, energy resolution of the ECAL is around six percent for at at uh, one GeV, and as far as the uh, production of the ECAL modules con uh, sectors concerned, three out of 25 sectors are uh, produced and uh, 14 out of 25 are in production for stage one. The next detector is forward hydron calorimeter. The purpose of this detector is uh, to, to estimate the event centrality and the reaction plane measurement for uh, collective flow, such as uh, collective flow measurement uh, analysis. It also can be used for event triggering. There are two identical detectors, which with 44 models as shown in the left figure. And these are placed around uh, about 33.2 meter upstream and downstream of the center of the MPD detector. The size of the module is uh, 15 by 15 uh, centimeter square in, in transverse direction. Um, as far as uh, the construction status is, the module are, um, modules and FF, FEE boards are, uh, are produced and uh, are being uh, are tested. The relative uh, and resolution is around 55% at, uh, at 1 GeV. Um, now the next one is the fast forward detector. It is, uh, uh, it is used for, it is, will be used for uh, producing, uh, providing the fast triggering of uh, nucleus nucleus collision, and it will generate a start time for, uh, for TOF detectors, and uh, the, it, it can provide uh, this uh, time with, uh, with time resolution better than 50 picoseconds. The detector is uh, consists of 20 Cherenko modules and it is uh, situated 140 centimeters from, from center of uh, the detector upstream and downstream. Uh, it can provide trigger efficiency of around uh, about 100% for central to mid central collision. Now to some, some, some uh, uh, performance plots. So firstly, on the left, I show you the Z vertex resolution um, in n millimeter as a function of track multiplicity. Uh, the uncertainty is uh, is of order of 20, sorry, 200, 200 micron at high, high track multiplicity, and it, it goes down by factor two to three at uh, low multi track multiplicity events. On the right, I show you the transverse and the longitudinal position uncertainties at uh, at PCA, uh, at, for high high PT tracks, it is um, it it, it uh, gives around a one to one point five mm of uh, uncertainty, but at low PT track, uh, uh, it it worsens quite a lot. Then 
here uh, the plots for uh, PT resolution of the charge particle as a function of PT on the left and as a function of pseudo rapidity on the right. Integrated uh, PT, resolu PT resolution uh, in the mid rapidity is around 2%. And uh, if you look at the more differential, then as a function of PT, it varies between uh, 2 to 4%. So now uh, for the particle identification with MPD. Um, so detectors which uh, which have been used and uh, are TPC, TOF, and uh, ECAL. So speaking in, uh, for electrons, so I will showing I'm showing the plot for electrons. So this is n sigma plot for TPC. Uh, so the the PID is uh, done using the d by dx information. Uh, in TPC uh, for the TOF and EKL uh, time of flight and the EYP measurements are, um, are done. Uh, so with TPC and TOF, um, enough uh, and a decent amount of purity can be achieved, which I will show also in the next few plots. And uh, for, for um, to gain a higher purity for high PT as well as high invariant mass in, in case of dielectron measurements, ECAL is, is uh, very, very helpful. So these are some QA plots. On the left, I show you the signal electron reconstruction efficiency. Uh, and here you can see that uh, with ECAL, uh, addition to, uh, in addition to TPC and TOF, we, we could get about 40% uh, uh, reconstruction efficiency for the electrons, uh, about, about 200 MeV. As far as electron purity on the right concern, uh, TPC and TOF can provide a decent purity up above between 70 to uh, 90 percent uh, at, at high PT, about 1, 1, 1 GV. As far as ECAL concern, ECAL gives us around almost 100 percent uh, purity throughout the PT region. Um, to, to flaunt uh, uh, again the capability of ECAL uh, in, in getting rid of uh, Hydrogen contamination. I show you the invariant mass distribution of uh, E plus E minus pairs, uh, both the reconstructed and then true reconstructed uh, for TPC plus TOF on the left and the TPC plus TOF plus ECAL on the right. And uh, it is very nice to see that high for high uh, invariant mass ma invariant masses, ECAL does a very good job and uh, get rid of the contamination uh, very very well. Now, speaking of uh, the theme of the presentation, that is uh, dielectron. So there are many sources of dielectrons, as we all know. Uh, among the signal, there is a major uh, source of background, that is uh, uh, dielectric decays and uh, the contribution from the dielectric decays. So for us, the major uh, for uh, is the major challenge is to reduce the combinatorials from this uh, this background and improve the signal background ratios. Uh, in the current scheme of simulations in MPD route, uh, we are using URKMD and PHSD for uh, background as well as, and uh, signal uh, study respectively. Along with this, uh, uh, results with Pluto are currently being studied and uh, soon we will also use these results and see the improvement or the difference between our previous results. Um, uh, as far as uh, the current uh, situation and the ongoing studies are concerned. The main focus is on a uh, few things. The first is to optimization of the track and EID selection curves. Since we are in the uh, we are in a feasibility study stage, uh, for instance, um, to get the more differential DC parameterization for different uh, you know phi phi taking into account the phi dependence, PT dependence, centrality dependence, also. Uh, to get a better control over a track to TOF matching, as well as uh, EID within uh, different uh, detector systems like TPC, TOF, and ECAL. Uh, we are also putting special efforts um, to reduce the combinatorial background from gamma convergence, as well as uh, Dalit's decades of uh, pi zero and eta. For instance, uh, for the rejection of convergence, we are uh, looking at the DCA um, uh, selection which we're doing a quite a good job, uh, which I will show in the next slides. The next one is the rejection of the uh, dialysis decay track candidates. 
in this uh, one can we, we are trying to do one can do that uh, uh, recognize firstly tag the fully uh, reconstructed pi zero dali tracks and then uh, recognize them and then not not use them for further pairing to reduce the combinatorial risk from them. Uh, moreover, one can also divide the acceptance into fiducial and veto area for the better recognition of the Dalit pair. Uh, of course, the criteria for such a investigation and the optimization is that to have a larger statistical significance and higher signal to background ratio, which corresponds to smaller statistical and the systematic uncertainties respectively. As far as signal concern, we are focusing at the moment on the low mass region, that is 0.2 to 0.6 GB per C square, and also the low mass vector meson resonance, that is phi rho and omega. So, uh, in the first thing, uh, first source of uh, possible source of background is conversion electrons. So, here I show you the number of conversion electrons as a function of uh, uh, true production radius in centimeter. Uh, black is, uh, is, is the distribution with no uh, applied no, no DCA cut and the color scheme is for different uh, sigma of the DCA cuts. Uh, here it's, I mean it can be easily seen that the, the contribution uh, from the convergence at beam time is yet to be, um, it's not, is not uh, effectively eliminated by this selection. So uh, this this act as a source of combinatorial background and uh, work on this and improvement of uh, uh, this for this area is ongoing. Uh, same plot is shown here for the pairs now instead of single electron. And again, the same thing is uh, seen that the combination uh, contribution from the convergent pairs at beam pipe is not being uh, eliminated using this DC cut. So this is uh, under study and. Uh, so next one is um, the rejection of uh, E plus E minus pairs from pi zero Dalit. So this is just an example plot. So here uh, I show you the like sign uh, spectrum, uh, uh, invariant mass spectrum. The red is the is the like sign spectrum after applying DC selection, and uh, in the black uh, it's it's applying DC selection plus some uh, selection which I explained in the previous slides that. Uh, Firstly, you try to uh, tag the recon fully reconstructed tracks from the pi zero Dalit and uh, recognize them as a pi zero. They are from pi zero, and uh, then do not use them for further uh, further uh, pairing. And uh, this is done uh, by by uh, constructing a fiducial acceptance of, uh, for example, eta 0.3, and then veto is in uh, veto is uh, 0.3 to one. And you can see that uh, within this uh, low mass region, we can get up to improvement of a factor almost two. And such type of uh, different uh, um, analysis strategies can can help us bringing the uh, that's, uh, eliminating the commun uh, combinatorials and uh, further improving the signal to background ratio. So this is being currently studied. So, uh, three minutes. If you could come then to the conclusions. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's just one slide remaining. Uh, so, as far as the so for, currently we are in the process of optimizing the selection cuts, and uh, we are hoping that this could lead some improvements. As far as current status concerned, we can get up to a signal to background ratio between five to ten percent for the mass range of 0.2 to 1.5 GB per C square. So we are putting, uh, we are dedicated to dedicated. We are putting dedicated efforts in the direction to uh, improve the signal to background ratio. So with this, I would like to conclude. Uh, dielectrons are very important probe and uh, capable of delivering strong physics messages. Uh, in that context, uh, MPD has a very exciting uh, dielectron program uh, anticipated. MPD. Uh, uh, is, is capable of providing excellent PID and uh, tracking as well as high purity uh, and uh, which can further be achieved with ECAL. Various event generators are being used to simulate the events and uh, we are in, in constant um, uh, effort to, to, to reduce the uh, combinatorial background from convergence and uh, DALIT. So thank you very much for your attention.
talk. Now we have uh, time for questions. Are there questions from the so Herr Hall, yeah. yeah. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. I was just uh, interested to, um, to know what did you use for the response of the TPC, I mean, the ADX resolution, and what do you base the simulation, what type of TPC or from where you took it? Okay. Um, can you repeat? I couldn't understand. The simulation of the ADX, and so you, you need to have a response model for the TPC. So I wonder which one you used. Mm, I'm afraid I don't know the inside details of this. Is something about uh, staging. So is this a, a day one experiment or uh, what in, in the MPD? So. Uh, uh, in 2023, the beam shall be ready and first data taken at 9.2 GV. You showed here simulations at 11 GV. And is uh, is it fully equipped, the detector already, or is it? Yes. Can you say? I, yes, yes. Actually, the results for uh, uh, bismuth bismuth are also there, but for the consistency, I have put for the only gold gold 11, which is the beam, uh, which is the actually the. Um, beam and the energy is uh, going to be there uh, uh, beyond 2023. So in 2024, we will have gold gold and at 11 top energy. Bismuth bismuth is the uh, for the acceleration accelerator complex people they have uh, for the technical run uh, it will be available for first year only. From Michael Osipenko uh, or yeah. comment? Yes, I, I, I just seen, uh, I noticed that you mentioned that the, there is an energy resolution of forward calorimeter of 55%. Uh, uh, I'm not sure this is a realistic number. I mean, uh, are you sure it's not a mistype? 55% um, at 1G this, is really, really very, very bad. No, no, this is far forward uh, side. So this will detect the spectators, I guess. And then, for example, if you have a beam of uh, 9.2, I guess this will go down up to, I think, 18 or something for that. So this is this is for, um, I mean, estimation of centrality and reaction plane. So, so this is at one GV, but for the for the spectator, for example, you have a beam of 9.2, the spectator E will be 9.2, so around, so it will be around 15 or 18 percent, I guess. But what are the, the, these modules? What uh, are are these crystals or uh, uh, sandwich or what? What are the what is the technology used in this uh, calorimeter? I think this is the lead sandwich, uh, lead uh, plates, and I think uh, the scintillator, the sandwich of them. Okay. Yeah. Much. Uh, we will have sandwiches and shashlik and coffee now, and uh, we reconvene then after 15 minutes. So, thank you very much for the talk for all speakers of this session. <laughs>